Thank you. And would you please join me in the flag salute? Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. First, uh, we are now at item five. First, I'll check in with the council and see if anyone has any reason to reorder anything this evening. Okay, then we will proceed as published. And I will turn it over to our city attorney for closed session announcements. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So uh, on February 13th, 2024, we did have a closed session item. The agenda description that's listed on tonight's agenda was read into the record at that time. And at that meeting on the 13th following closed session, the city council adjourned at 9.54 p.m. and there was no reportable action on the 13th. Thank you very much. And for item 5B on ordinances, I will move that all ordinances presented at the meeting shall be read in title only and all further readings be waived. Second. The motion is second. Can we get a voice vote, please? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries 5-0. So that takes us right away to the fun stuff, special presentations. The first one is an honorary proclamation recognizing March 2024 as Women's History Month. And I will see at the podium Kathy LaMartina and Linda Kind, like, would you come up? <laughs> it is exciting here. You can come over here. Make sure the camera gets you both. And they are representing the South County Historical Society. This is an honorary proclamation recognizing March 2024 as Women's History Month. Whereas American women of every race, class, and ethnic background have made historic contributions to the growth and strength of our nation in countless recorded and unrecorded ways. Whereas American women have played and continue to play critical economic, cultural, and social roles in every sphere of the nation by constituting a significant portion of the labor force working inside and outside of the home. And whereas American women have played a unique role throughout history of our nation, by providing the majority of volunteer labor force of the nation. And whereas American women were particularly important in the establishment of early charitable, philanthropic, and cultural institutions in our nation. And whereas American women of every race, class, and ethnic background served as early leaders in the forefront of every major progressive social change movement. And whereas American women have served our country courageously in the military. And whereas American women have been leaders, not only in securing their own rights of suffrage and equal opportunity, but also in the abolitionist movement, the emancipation movement, the industrial labor movement, the civil rights movement, and other movements, especially the peace movement, which create a more fair and just society for all. Whereas despite these contributions, the role of American women in history has been consistently overlooked and undervalued in the literature teaching and study of American history. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Karen Ray Russum, mayor of the city of Aurora Grande, do, I'm inserting enthusiastically, hereby designate March as Women's History Month and call upon the residents of Aurora Grande to observe Women's History Month with appropriate programs, ceremonies, and activities. And I invite you both to speak. No, you want to go ahead? Um, thank you very much, Mayor and City Council. Um, I just wanted to say that there's another organization in our community, the American Association of University Women, that also celebrate uh, Women's History Month. And uh, some of the ladies dress in costume and they take on the role of famous women in history. And they, they pre uh, present a living history program to the students of the Lucia Marsh School District. So I didn't know if any, everybody was aware of that program. I just want to say this is for Harriet Quimby <laughs> and Rosario Cooper and, of course, uh, the Paulding ladies, the teachers, which are so important to our society. So thank you for this. We will frame it and hang it so people can see it. Thank you. Somebody's calling Jim and letting him know it's me. Thank you very much. 
And I will say, uh, as a history teacher, I can appreciate this uh, so much. And uh, sitting at a dais with three other fantastic women, sorry, Jim. Um, and uh, it is wonderful to serve with you all. And I will bring up that on the South County Sanitation District Board, it is my favorite part when our plant superintendent begins his presentation with ladies of the board, because <laughs> there are no gentlemen anyway. All right, would anyone like to say anything? All right, then we will move on to 6B. This is City Manager Communications, Mr. Downing. Well, thank you, Mayor, members of Council, Matt Downing, City Manager. Uh, a couple of updates for you this evening. First and foremost, over the weekend, we did have the Meet the Machine Machines event. We had over a thousand people attend. Uh, I know I was there with my two children. We had, they didn't want to go at first and then they ended up having a blast. So uh, it was a lot of fun. We had over 20 different community partners there and we did uh, give out free goodie bags to the first 300 children who showed up. So that was a lot of fun. And we thank uh, Recreation Services for their for that activity. <clears throat> and then also, uh, don't forget that we uh, do let some bunny, yes, bunny, not buddy, let some bunny know that uh, you love them by sending a bunny gram. So if you uh, purchase a bunny gram, the Arroyo Grande Bunny will personally deliver a basket of treats to an address in the five cities area. And if you'd like more information on that, contact the Recreation Services Department. Uh, over in our city clerk's uh, office, the Legislative and Information Services Department, uh, wanted to make the public aware that in an effort to continue to make the city's uh, public meetings accessible, the city council and planning commission meetings will now be streamed through YouTube. So that's through the city's YouTube channel beginning tonight. Uh, I did have it on my screen and it was working. It's a little delayed, but it's fine. Um, so that's going well. And uh, you'll be able to actually see it on our YouTube channel following the meeting as well. So that's where we'll be hosting those uh, now on. And then uh, sir, we also have the city's uh, survey mailer that was sent to mailboxes in the city and also on the city's website. So we do want to hear from the public, uh, as we've said before, and we are taking the survey all the way through March 31st. So if you got one of those in your mailbox, please uh, feel free to fill it out, send it back or go online and fill it in or drop it off at City Hall. We're happy to take it. Our police department is very pleased to announce we have a uh, new addition to the department. Officer Timothy Wilson uh, began his field training officer program on Monday and I got to meet him. Uh, actually happened to be in the police department when he was getting some gear and so I got to meet him there. Uh, he will be formally sworn in and introduced to the council in the coming weeks. So we, we do anticipate that probably on the March 12th meeting depending on his availability as well. And then for uh, Five Cities Fire, wanted to note that uh, former Chief Lieberman's last day was yesterday, and we are joined this evening by uh, Interim Chief Keith Agson back in the back. Uh, and so we thank Keith uh, for Chief Agson for filling in for the next two months. He'll be with us through April. We're doing the Fire Chief uh, interview panels on Thursday and Friday of this week, so we're looking forward to uh, getting somebody selected in that process uh, and moving that on. And funny enough, uh, on his first day off, I ran into Chief Lieberman at the uh, grocery store earlier today, so that was fun. And then last but certainly not least, I did want to commend our um, Administrative Services Director, Nicole Valentine, and our Finance Manager uh, for, we received the Meritorious Award for fiscal year 2023 and 25 for our biennial budget document from the California Society of Municipal Finance Officers. And my understanding is that is a first for us. So that was very exciting and congratulations to them. And that concludes my comments this evening. Outstanding. Let's see if the council has any questions. I just had one thing. I meant to, I left that survey, I got mine yesterday, and I left it on my counter, and I meant to bring it as a visual aid. Um, thank you. Can you pass that? Oh, there, uh, I don't know if uh, the camera will point at Jessica. Oh, I thought you were going to talk, and I was going to be Vanna. Oh, you could be Vanna, but what I want you to see is there is a tear-off for you to rank um, some of the things that we think you might be saying and a place for you to fill in what we might not know you care about. Mm -hmm. um, and you can either put a snail mail stamp on that and give it back to us or scan the QR code if you're cheap like me and you don't want to spend the money. So there is a QR code on there for you to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So please tell us, the more people that um, that participate in this, the better the document's going to be. So thank you for that. All right. So this takes us straight into, oops, I'm looking at the wrong agenda, city council reports. So uh, I will go first. 
CJPIA has not met. Central Coast Blue did meet a week and a half ago, and um, I am happy to report nothing from that um, because it was all closed session, so I'm not allowed to. Um, Five Cities Fire Authority has not met since my last report. Uh, I take that back. You met. You met, but I wasn't there, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so I will leave that to uh, Councilmember George to report out on. Uh, the San Luis Obispo County Sanitation District did meet. Um, we had two items on the agenda, but they were pretty rote. One of them was the rotation of the chair and vice chair, and the second one was the continued updates about the secondary clarifier damage. The update is it's still being um, repaired, so it's, it's uh, not much to update there. Finally, the mayor's meeting um, was really, really interesting. Uh, it was the first one that I left really, I don't know if inspired is the right word, but excited about uh, possibilities. Uh, I didn't know about this, perhaps the city manager did, that there, um, how do I say this succinctly? Paso Robles is thinking about getting a whole bunch of us together, not just our county, but Santa Barbara County, to be able to do a um, website, uh, not a website, a a I don't want to call it a, a, a site that would take care of what's called, um, what are they called? PFAS, P-F-A-S, which is the forever chemicals that stay in our groundwater and uh, in our environment. They're talking about um, possibly putting together a, uh, through the private sector partnership, um, a facility that would deal with both PFAS and with um, harnessing natural gas from uh, uh, biosolids. And there's a lot here and a couple of staff reports that are really, really interesting. My kid is now studying environmental engineering. I immediately got on the phone with him and he could tell me all about it. I'm going to pass this on to our city manager. It's very much in the planning stages, but it has the potential to move fairly quickly because they already have an operator that is willing to build the facility. So it doesn't have to go through the public process as it would if governmental agencies were taking it through the process. So it has the possibility of potentially even being online as soon as 2025. So it's state-of-the-art stuff. It's being done all over Europe, but it has not been done here yet um, and not I don't remember which of the two processes, but one of the two processes has not been done in California yet, um, even though it has been done all over the place elsewhere. So it's very exciting possibilities for being able to do some serious environmental cleanup and have it be uh, at no increased cost to the taxpayer. So that's my reports, and I will turn it over to uh, Mayor Pro Tem Guthrie. So uh, uh, the RAC did not meet. I was canceled kind of at the last minute. Um, and there was no REACH report since my last report. Um, from community, uh, from our community electric group, we did have a meeting. Um, we, we reviewed uh, fairly extensively how the energy markets changed, uh, particularly over the availability of solar. So we can expect to see less emphasis on solar and more emphasis on uh, things like batteries, things that will reduce peak, which is not no longer in the afternoon. It's now in the evening and even into the late evening. So they are looking at ways or programs that will encourage that. Like say, in any kind of uh, energy storage, they just completed a compressed air energy storage program that apparently was fairly successful and uh, and new. Um, also, we're dealing with what are called slice of day regulations, which is basically a regulation that says you have to have on contract enough power to sort of cover your worst hour possible, which is uh, very complicated. Uh, something that I would never have even thought of. If you have a contract with a electric supplier and they decide it's more about it's worth paying the penalty, then they will just move their contract. Yeah, they're just pay the pet whatever the penalties are in the contract and, and sell it to somebody else. So you have to kind of constantly play a play a little game there to keep your contracts in place, um, which never occurred to me that kind of a problem. Um, and uh, interestingly, uh, 
they have just purchased a building in downtown San Luis Obispo near the courthouse. So that the uh, their facilities here, which were kind of buried out by the airport somewhere, will now be right downtown for their training and the kinds of things they want to do. So be be a nice addition to the downtown downtown San Luis Obispo. IWMA, IWMA, we have integrated waste management. We've moved back to the county supervisor chambers, which is which is uh, nice because it has a a, a, a lot more uh, technical facility than within, even though the city of Slocos has the latest thing, uh, because of the way it works on our website, we were unable to uh, to to have the meetings available after the, the, the videos after the meeting. So that's, that's going to be a big plus because we've had a lot of complaints about that. We did do the mid-year review. Uh, Going in with the county is projected to put a $79,000 ahead in reserves, so we'll probably be looking at another, probably small, but another reduction in the in the fees that we pay AWMA to, to provide those services. Um, at SLOCOG, we had the unmet needs uh, public hearing, the first one. Um, expecting a big increase in the number of unmet needs because we changed the criteria. It used to be you had to meet all four of the criteria, and now you only have to meet three of them to get them to study. Because it used to be they never had to study anything because nobody could could, could, could meet them all, um, especially the reasonable to, 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 to deliver one. Um, and most of those, most of the ones that they have so far, that's going on, I think at the end of this month, it closes and we'll do the final one and the, the final version of it in April. But primarily they're around bus extending service, either more frequency or more hours. Um, they did come back with their supplemental funding. Um, I think it's very unlikely that they'll go forward. It actually only went forward another step by one vote. So uh, nearly stopped, I think we'll be having a presentation from them in April, I think I saw on, uh, on, on what they found with the additional polling they did. Um, and we put together at least the first draft of what are called the transit performance measures. Uh, so are we looking at, you know, on-time performance or, or full buses or, or you know, the, the kind of performance that we'll be looking for for the next four years, kind of a goals thing. And those are my reports. Thank you very much. Councilmember Barnage. Neither of my committees have met since um, the I last reported out. The meetings are coming up, but not yet. Nothing to report, thanks. Councilmember George. So I have reports, but full disclosure, my laptop just died. So, um, and it's not a battery thing, so who knows. But I have my report on my phone, so I'm not texting anyone, I'm just giving you the update. Okay, so Five Cities Fire Authority. First of all, thank you for um, coming and stepping in. We definitely um, appreciate your service and I know that you came out of retirement for it. So we just appreciate you being here. Okay, uh, we did have, we met on January 29th. Um, we did have a proclamation recognizing Chief Lieberman for his service and retirement. And I believe um, the chief was recognized probably 50 times over the past month in every area of the city. So um, that was uh, another one of the times. Um, we had a presentation uh, regarding a December 20th um, rescue mission. And I, I kind of shared it the last council meeting because it was, it was quite uh, moving, but the uh, the fire department basically came and rescued a, a gentleman that was stuck in a drain pipe um, on December 20th, and that was quite moving. Uh, let's see, we've authorized the purchase of a used tiller truck from Ventura uh, and that uh, and associated training. So that, that purchase that we authorized will not exceed 25,000. And the great thing about that is this tiller is a pretty big uh, machine chief will probably know more than I will, but it's hard to m drive and maneuver. So I don't think we're expected to, to receive ours, the one that we purchased until like three or four years from now. Um, but having this one allows our staff to train. So that when we do get ours, it'll uh, be an easy get up and go. And for 25,000, that was a, a fairly reasonable price to uh, purchase a used tiller. Um, we received a $50,000 grant from the State of California Office of Traffic Safety to offset purchase of, a, of new extrication, extrication equipment, which proves that we absolutely need it because on December 20th, we needed that equipment. And I believe we had to um, have another agency uh, come with their equipment to extricate the, um, the gentleman. 
Uh, we approved new counsel, Alice Shire and Winder LLP Law Firm will be our new law firm as uh, David Hale is uh, retiring. And then we had a management update from our uh, City Manager uh, Matt Downing. Um, Oceano Fire Service Delivery is continuing um, negotiation with the county. We're just in in conversation with them to see if there is an appetite to uh, retain Five Cities Fire Authority services after our current contract expires. And um, we're welcoming Keith Eggson, um on as our interim fire chief. And those are my updates, thank you. Our next meeting is um, March 7th at five. No TBID? No TBID. Oh, that's cool. All right, Councilmember Seacrest. Thank you. So uh, the Air Pollution Control District Board met um, on uh, January 24th and had elections, and Jimmy Paulding will be the board chair, and Jan Marks will be the vice chair. And then they had um, an appointment for APCD board rep, it's a mouthful, for South Central Coast Basin Wide Air Pollution control council and i got that so very excited that will be me <laughs> you learn to say it I, it's they all abbreviate it but I, if i abbreviate it well no one will know what we're talking about um so they used to have it's uh involves ventura santa barbara and slow counties and it used to be that you rotated you could see where this is going to the different counties like santa barbara for your meetings but now they do it remotely from the slow office, which is fine. Um, <laughs> and it's a great way to learn more about um, all of the air pollution uh, issues, which there's quite a lot of them. Um, and especially one big thing, you know, air pollution doesn't re respect boundaries. So a lot of moving. Um, they had a presentation on their clean air rooms, which if you haven't heard of it, is a program to supply high quality air filters um, to folks that may not be able to afford them and yet are in situations where um, they can have issues with asthma and other breathing and health issues. And it's a way to have a family dedicate like one small part of their house to having very clean air. And they also will get notifications of when there's you know, a dip in air quality. Um, so that I believe that's been going on for a year or two, but it's been, we voted to continue it. So that seems like a really good program. Um, and there was also, there was a number of presentations. One was on asbestos and there's an asbestos NESHAP program. I'm sorry, I can't remember what NESHAP stands for, but basically they're trying to educate the public. Asbestos is still a big health hazard and it is used in construction. There's a lot of good reasons why, but they're trying to uh, get the word out about the dangers um, and how to be safe, so. And then there was the South County um, Chamber meeting. Um, which has changed formats, and it's now going to be combined with the government meeting for, sorry, Chamber of Commerce, I forget what that's called. The, so the point is, instead of having a Wednesday meeting and then an end of the month Friday morning meeting, they've combined them, I believe it's the second Wednesday of the month. Um, it seems pretty efficient, and you can come to the uh, coffee meet and greet in the morning, hear the government officials, usually the supervisors and other representatives from the cities will speak, give updates, and then there'll be the um, smaller government meeting. So that's all I have, thank you. <laughs> all right, great. So that concludes the council updates and that takes us to item eight. This is community comments and suggestions. This is your chance to come talk to the council about items that are not on tonight's agenda. So if you'd like to step forward and do so, please do that and you'll get three minutes and please address the council as one body. Hang on just one second. We need to turn on your mic and we'll, and if you would uh, also, you'll get a timer over there on your right that you can keep an eye on. Okay. Thank you, mayor and council for hearing me. My name is Carolyn Roof and I'm a resident of Arroyo Grande. I am here representing myself, but I am sure there are many people in my community that feel the same way I do. I am afraid, I'm worried, and just plain mad. I am here to speak briefly about the Verizon cell phone tower and how it has impacted my husband and I and our many neighbors. I'm not sure the committee tasked with the construction and placement of the tower even considered us. I don't know what's more frustrating, being overlooked or being invisible. This is my statement. 
My husband and I retired to the Central Coast in 2008 and reside in the Sunrise Terrace Senior Mobile Home Park in Arroyo Grande. We love living near our grandchildren in this beautiful community. We are very concerned about the proposed construction and placement of a 55-foot cell phone tower at the park's entrance, 80 feet from our backyard. The plan to disguise it as a water tower does not fool anyone. On top of having this ugly eyesore to look at from our windows, my husband and I and all our neighbors will be in an area of elevated RF exposure. Apparently, according to the city code, cell phone towers are permitted as close as 50 feet from a residence. I don't see how this is acceptable. As you know, on February 6th, the Arroyo Grande Planning Commission voted to deny the permit to construct this tower at the proposed location. We applaud their decision. We hope that Verizon will pursue other viable alternative sites like St. John's Church. Until this happens, we will stay vigilant. Seems the laws need to be changed in favor of the people who live here. We hope that this cell phone tower is erected where it will help residents not hurt them. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak on items not on tonight's agenda? Mayor, City Council, my name is Robert Thronson. I've been a realtor for 30 years, 20 years on the Central Coast and 10 years in the Central Valley. I'd like to talk to you about the uh, property values. I, I'm in Sunrise Terrace and uh, I'm speaking about on behalf of myself. Uh, the California Association of Realtors Property Sellers Questionnaire specifically lists cell towers on a disclosure form for sellers of real estate. The seller must, and I stress rust, Note neighborhood nuisances and other problems, including cell towers. Many people are skeptical because of the health risks and impact on property values. Increasing number of people don't want to live near cell towers. In some areas with new towers, property values have decreased up to 20%. A recent survey by the National Institute for Science found that 94% of homeowners are less interested and pay, and pay less for a property located near a cell tower or antenna. The U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development long considered cell towers as hazardous and nuisances. The FHA appraiser must, and I indicate must, indicate whether the dwelling or related property improvements are located near a cell phone tower or high voltage transmission line. Basically, I'm telling you as a realtor, most likely your home will decrease in value up to 20% if you live near a cell tower. And uh, again, if you were to look at the location that Verizon is proposing, uh, it is very, very close to the nearest residence of Sunrise Terrace Mobile Home Park off of Valley. So uh, again, I'm against the cell tower being placed where they propose. Thank you very much. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak on item not on tonight's agenda? Hi. Hi. My name is Renee Rufino and I also live uh, at Sunrise Terrace on Muirfield. I am neighbors with the roofs and the cell tower will be in between our backyards. <clears throat> I'm very much against it. I know everybody wants cell phone um, availability and um, you know, to be able to call somebody and not have to go outside and find a bar and whatever to get your cell phone to work. But I really think it's not a great place for the tower. And I wish it would really reconsider um, having it there. I retired two years ago and I was really excited and I'm the first house on the first street, which is Muirfield, and you know, it's just a great place to live. And uh, I have two grandkids and they're over every now and then, but 
Um, Aurora Grande is a great place to live, and I'd like to not have to look at that tower every time I pull in. I thank you. Would anyone else like to speak on items not on tonight's agenda? And seeing no one in the chambers, let's check in with the city clerk. If any members of the public on Zoom would like to make a comment, please raise your hand. And there are no raised hands. Thank you. So we'll close public comment. And we will move on to the consent agenda. So this is items 9, collectively 9A through 9F. So first I will check in with the council to see if anyone would like to ask a question or pull an item for separate consideration. All right, and then we will go ahead and open up public comment on the consent agenda. Again, this is items 9A through 9F. Would anyone like to speak on those items? And seeing no one blazing a trail to the podium, I'll check in with the city clerk. If any members of the public on Zoom would like to make a comment, please raise your hand. There are no raised hands. Thank you. So I'll close public comment, bring us back to the council for consideration and for possible action. Anyone have deliberation or would like to make a motion? Madam Mayor, I would move for approval of items 9A through 9F. Second. Any discussion? All right, we have a motion and a second. Can we get a roll call, please? Councilmember Barnett? Yes. Councilmember George? Yes. Councilmember Seacrest? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Guthrie? Yes. Mayor Bay Russum? Yes. That moves us quickly to item 10A, and I, uh, I'll go ahead and announce it, and then we have a couple of things to say here. We are going to conduct a public hearing and consider a resolution denying the installation of one domestic well on a property zoned plan development. The applicant is Michael Harris. The representative is Richard Bird of Slow Civil Design and Marcia Birch, attorney at law. So first I'll turn it over to our city attorney and then uh, to Councilmember George. Sure, and I actually think it'd be uh, appropriate if, if Councilmember George has an announcement first and then I can provide just a brief update. Thank you. Um, thank you, I'm just gonna announce a recusal. Um, I own a property which is roughly 446 feet from the subject property. I do not believe that I have a reasonable, reason, reasonably foreseeable financial interest in this well application decision and that any impact on my property would be hypothetical. However, in order to avoid any appearance of um, impropriety, I'm I'm going to recuse myself from voting this evening. So if you'll give me a moment to collect my things, I will um, head out. Thank you. And so by process and requirement, we need to wait for Councilmember George to leave the room. So I guess we will send Jessica in to get you at the end of the I'm hearing. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I meant to get you in the room. Oh, oh yes. To get me in the room. As in, go get you when you're in the room to tell you to come back out. Oh, it's usually on video. So okay. <laughs> Who's on first? Uh, thank you, Mayor. So I did want to make just a brief announcement regarding tonight's notice public hearing. So um, we did want to make the council aware, make the city aware that we did receive roughly 1,500 pages of material from applicant um, shortly before sort of our posting deadline at 4 p.m. tonight. So there, there was a um, supplemental uh, that was posted with the agenda this evening that includes the material and the hyperlinks. Uh, but I did want to note the city team hasn't had a chance yet to review all of that material uh, at this time. Uh, that submitted material is part of the administrative record. Um, the city council, as a decision-making body, is required to take any evidence uh, under submission and make a determination on the facts uh, presented. So it will ultimately be the council's decision tonight, uh, should you wish to continue the item or take more time, uh, should you have questions, or follow up regarding uh, the supplemental information that was presented. Uh, my understanding is the applicant is present and prepared to present um, and the city uh, team as well is prepared to answer questions and we did notice tonight as a, a public hearing so the council can certainly take public comment and, and decide after that time should it wish to uh, take any further actions or uh, require more time regarding any of the information. Thank you very much. Um, 
And Councilor Rose Seacrest, I see your chin hit the desk. So <laughs> do you have a clarifying question you'd like to ask or anything? Thank you. Um, I actually had two things I wanted to talk about, but, the, but since you just mentioned the 1,500 pages, was that supposed to have come to us and we were supposed to have digested that? Because that definitely did not happen for me. Uh, it is part of the record, so it is sort of presented as part of the public hearing this evening. Um, council has the discretion as, as the decision-making body in terms of what evidence it wishes to consider. And, and again, I know applicant is, is present tonight for the notice public hearing to make their own presentation. However, the, the information submitted is part of the record for the hearing. And so it, it becomes a question of whether the council, you know, ultimately between taking public comment or applicant's presentation would like time to further digest that, that information. Um, so the council really has the discretion uh, on that. Thank you. I guess just stating the obvious, if if that's in the record and it's supposed to be considered, there's no way that I can do that tonight. So I'm not sure where that leads us. So I, I have some thoughts on this. Thank um, you. First of all, everybody's here and we have a publicly noticed hearing. Um, so as is what we would normally do in this case is um, because we were ready to go with no continuance um, on the record, my suggestion is that we go through the hearing as we normally would. And uh, we have public here ready to comment. We have a presentation ready to go. Staff's ready to go. Let's go through all of that first. And then we, we can deliberate and then decide to continue deliberations as necessary. Um, and it sounds like we've got at least one who would like to do that. We'll talk to the city manager at that time about what that looks like and when that could be. So uh, how about we defer that conversation until after we, when we get to council deliberations? Does that sound good? Thank, thank you. And then I just can I, of course, yeah. just have like one small announcement. I don't know Mr. Harris, but I did speak to him. He, we had a phone call last year just talking a little bit about the project. He explained where his property was. Um, and then he later, I think it was about a month or two later, caught me when I was coming out of a city council hearing and again just kind of explained what he was trying to do and um, kind of what the process had been. I don't think I have a conflict. I, I don't, but I want everyone to know that we did have some discussions. No, Thank and our, our council handbook requires the declaration of ex parte communications, so you're doing the right thing. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. And thank you, Mayor. That's exactly what I was going to say. Um, and then the other note is just we do have, again, the, the supplemental material was posted uh, as part of the online agenda, we have one copy we were able to print beforehand. So we do have one copy available in chambers this evening, but otherwise the information is available online. I'd like to see page 487 right now. No, I'm just kidding. Um, did that come via email to us as a supplemental normally would? Yes. It did. We got okay. it at, I was just looking. What time did you say, Jim? 438. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, let's just, explain some process here. So what is, it, it, this isn't, a, um, it's not an appeal, but we're kind of handling it as, as an appeal. So we're granting the, um, the applicant a little bit of time, which we didn't, wouldn't normally do. It would normally come as part of public comment. So here's how we're going to do this. So um, as is normal, we will have the staff give their presentation. Council will ask staff any clarifying questions if they have them. Then we'll invite the applicant up. You can choose whomever you'd like to have come up for the six minutes that we're going to grant you. To, so that could be you, that could be your, your uh, uh, either of your uh, uh, consultants, whatever works for you. Uh, then you, uh, hold, hold, just a moment, please. So we'll give you that six minutes. Then we'll ask you questions if the council has them. And then at that time, we'll open up public comment after that. So anybody who's here that's, that has not spoken yet will get the chance to come up. So the person who's come up first will get that six minutes. And then at that point, we'll stop that. If there's more to be said after that, we'll hear that during public comment afterwards. So you have two other people. They could conceivably each come up for three minutes apiece. There may be other public here who wants to speak. We don't know. But I do want to be clear that because this is something that is viewed at home, that the order of of the operations matters and that I will not entertain questions from the crowd there is an off there is a, a procedure to this so when it's time to come up here you're welcome to ask those questions as part of your commentary but uh, so we will again just to be clear about how we're going to do this we will have staff give presentation council will ask questions six minutes from the applicant council will ask qu clarifying questions if they have them 
and then at that point we will open up public comment take that comment and then after that it will be council deliberations uh, public comment will be closed and at that time it comes back to the council for only us to consider so let's begin with the staff report thank you uh, good evening mayor Arosum and council members uh, brian pedrotti community development director um, so uh, this is again a consider consideration of a resolution denying the installation of a domestic well. And um, it is staff's recommended denial of request of the property owner to drill and install a new domestic well at an unaddressed property on Noise Road, northeast of the intersection of Noise Road and Equestrian Way. And uh, just to piggyback on um, the mayor's comments regarding the process tonight, um, Maybe obvious to some folks, but um, I wanted to lay out what the role of the council is this evening. Um, council's considering staff's recommended denial as part of this public hearing, um, and we'll hear directly from the applicant, and then has the discretion to determine whether they agree or disagree with the city's recommended denial, notwithstanding um, what um, Isaac Rosen has said as well. Um, the city is reviewing the application before it on the facts submitted, and there's no current development application pending of any kind. Uh, the applicant is not precluded from revisiting the matter and or city's consideration of a future development application. So um, the property again is on Noise Road. It's, uh, here's an aerial showing uh, the property. Uh, and as you can see from this slide, um, it, um, the property is in this location. So in October of 2022, uh, the applicant submitted a well application to the San Luis Obispo County Environmental Health Department. And at the time, the city's utility manager uh, let Slow Health know that the city council would need to approve the well. In January of 2023, uh, the well application was submitted uh, to the city for domestic use. Uh, following staff review and requesting of additional information, staff began to plan for a March 2023 public hearing uh, but concerns by staff were raised during the review period leading up to and as part of the drafting of the staff report. And these concerns were expressed to Mr. Harris and then with a series of follow-up meetings uh, in March through October. It was ultimately scheduled on October 24th of 2023. And on the day of the hearing, Mr. Harris's attorney submitted a sizable letter with multiple legal assertions uh, and staff recommended a continuance to November 28th to allow for analysis and response. And then at the request of the applicant, the item has been continued again uh, to November, January 9th, 2024, and again to today's date. So chapter 13.8 of the Municipal Code requires the council to consider in its discretion approval for new or replacement wells or abandonment of existing wells. Um, approval within city boundaries may be granted if the council determines that one, the well will neither deplete nor contaminate the city water supply, and two, service from the city's water system is neither practical nor feasible. Uh, for the depletion contamination determination, uh, new proposals require verification of 100 foot distance from septic systems, uh, county environmental health approval, and metering for annual usage. Uh, the subject well meets these requirements um, the closest city well is about 2,800 feet to the southwest. It's outside of the Santa Maria groundwater basin. Uh, it's a different aquifer and there's no interference. For the practicality and feasibility determination, this is based on whether the city is reasonably able to provide domestic water uh, connection to the private property boundary. And it should not be based on the private property owner's cost of installing service, uh, nor based on topography of the site, um, those costs can be speculative and, and can result in inequities. So prior to 2017, uh, some costs to the applicant were considered, um, but these were only for temporary or replacement irrigation wells for agriculture or sports fields. Um, they strictly referred to meter connection fees. Uh, they were collected at the time of building permit issuance and they're based on the size of the connection. Uh, post 2017, well from 2017 to the present, there have been six total well applications, three domestic wells, and cost to applicant was not considered as part of those. 
uh, the factors that were consistently applied include distance from existing municipal water infrastructure, uh, necessary infrastructure improvements, uh, easements needed to connect supply, and whether the connection is outside city limits. So um, the staff has determined that it's practical and feasible to provide domestic water connection to the subject property. Uh, the parcel is immediately adjacent to city's re reservoir number five. Uh, residential water service can connect to the city owned main line from the tank. Uh, a standard water meter uh, would need to be on the owner's property. And it's approximately a 50 foot connection to the property boundary. And then no easements or improvements uh, to inf city infrastructure are needed. Uh, this is an aerial of the uh, kind of a close up of the aerial, uh, which shows the um, property in relation to reservoir number five. And then another close up uh, showing reservoir number five in the booster station building um, with little blue, that's showing up, a little blue line there, uh, which would be uh, the connection from, here's the booster building uh, and the water line is on this side. And I have another picture of that as well. So this shows the, um, the eight inch water line on the back of the booster station uh, with potential water service connection points that would run underground to the subject property with a standard meter service. So the applicant has argued that it is not practical and feasible. Um, uh, he cited a location of um, a preferred building site approximately 600 to 800 feet from the reservoir, um, citing greater grading of, on steeper slopes and through oak trees, and that the city should consider tree impacts through their community tree program. And then there's the ex they, they've identified the expense of connecting potential future home sites. Um, in terms of the location of building and slopes, um, those are proposed by the applicant and then reviewed by the city to ensure that uh, codes have been met. Uh, that has not occurred yet. Um, in terms of consideration of tree impacts, uh, there are none associated with the proposed well permit. Uh, the municipal code allows the director of public works to issue permits for removal and replacement of impacted oak trees. And then in terms of the expense of connecting potential future home sites, um, again, these costs are speculative. Uh, there have been no applications for structures uh, or development submitted uh, to this date. Uh, the council has approved several wells in the past, including replacement ag wells, replacement sports field irrigation wells, replacement domestic wells, and a new domestic well. Um, in terms of domestic well approvals, there was a replacement domestic well on Prince Road and a new domestic well on Easy Street. Uh, the nearest connection to the city water lines from these properties were over a thousand feet away. Uh, they needed to cross multiple properties, uh, private properties and open space. Uh, there would have been a need to get easements from these properties. Uh, the current application again is adjacent to city property. Uh, there are no easements or agreements with private properties necessary and it's close to the existing city reservoir. Um, and there's also some important distinctions here between um, ag and water and domestic water. So uh, for, for ag water, historically, properties have been connected to groundwater wells. Uh, they involve significant volumes of consumption uh, and these could negatively impact the municipal water system. Um, and they're not required to be treated for human consumption. Uh, domestic properties, historically, they've been connected to the municipal system. Uh, this is a mix of surface water, as you well know, Lopez and groundwater. Um, and so this must be managed by the city. There's conservation measures in place. Uh, we have cash for grass, outdoor watering days, um, tiered pricing, drought restrictions, uh, and, and it must be treated to potable standards. In terms of the CEQA determination, uh, denials are exempt from CEQA. Um, and then uh, staff has determined that even if, the pro uh, even if it was considered a project, um, 
must refer to the whole of an action that has a potential for direct physical change or reasonable foreseeable indirect physical change on the environment. And the indirect effect is not reason reasonably foreseeable. Uh, no application for development has been submitted. Uh, when a development application has been submitted, city will conduct environmental review on that uh, development application. Um, if the city council was to approve the well application, uh, approval uh, has been determined to be categorically, categorically exempt. So staff's recommendation is to adopt a resolution denying the installation of one new domestic well, supply well on the property, um, and determine that denial of an application is not a project under CEQA. Thank you. So let's check in with the council and see if there's any questions of staff. Um, Councilmember Barnage, do you have any questions? No questions, thank you. Councilmember Seacrest, questions of staff? Um, just very briefly, thank you. Um, when when you say that CEQA, one requirement is um, a whole of action needs to be met, I think I know what you mean, but could you explain a little bit further what that means? Uh, sure, Council Member Seacrest. So uh, when you look at the California Environmental Quality Act, you look at the information uh, that's related to the underlying action. And here the city council is just considering the well application. It's a discretionary decision whether to approve or deny. Uh, our determination in working with staff is if it's denied, that's exempt under its own exemption. Uh, and if it's approved, uh, if the well application was approved by the council, a categorical exemption would apply. Uh, what Mr. Pedrotti was referring to is that since the city doesn't have a development project application as part of this project, we couldn't environmentally evaluate sort of other development that's not part of the action before the council this evening. Okay, thank you. That's what I thought, but I just want to make sure. Um, and it, I think this is a question for Mr. Pedrotti, Director mm -hmm. Pedrotti. But is a residential application normally or usually made before a well application, or does it just depend? Um, it, it seems like there's a lot of unanswered questions in terms of the development. It, it depends, but also um, we rarely have uh, well applications. Uh, okay. domestic well applications. Um, so um, in terms of city water service, um, that would be part and parcel with a development application. But for, again, for domestic well, we, we don't really, we don't really have uh, a much of a history of, of domestic wells it's within the city boundary. Pretty unusual or? Yes. Okay, thank you. Nothing further, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. You are on. Yeah. Yep. Jimmy Proof. All right. Um, so, so my question is similar to that, in, in that um, you know, I was on council for a long time, for 12 years, and back here for a year, and I don't remember ever dealing with a a recommended denial of a of of a of a, of a well. In fact, I don't even remember voting on wells, although clearly we we did. And we've had what five applications since seventeen. In your experience or in your knowledge, do you know of any other wells that were requested that were denied at all? As you say, they're unusual. Um, certainly, they didn't make it to council. Um, just want to get some direction on on any previous denials. Uh, that's correct. There's we have, we don't have a history of uh, denials of uh, wells. Um, there's been discussions with folks. Um, about whether a well um, would be on the property, you know, if, if, if they proposed a well. And um, in the past, um, my understanding from our utilities manager is sometimes when we explain that there's city water available for the property, um, oftentimes they will just um, drop the request to go for a well and go to city water. Um, I know that um, uh, Shane is in the, is in the building if we have questions specifically about wells but um, and about water service, they can answer as well. All right, thank you. Maybe the new system will be more uh, <laughs> Councilmember Guthrie friendly. <laughs> um, so 
I've done my homework on this. We've seen a whole lot here. So the only question I have is really for public consumption. And I'm going to direct it towards the city manager just because I asked it previous to the meeting and I know he's prepared to answer it. And that is just in lay terms, um, why the recommendation for denial. Forget about what the code is saying and I don't want a legalese discussion, just really uh, a, a point by point <clears throat> reference as to, to, to why the city would take this position. Certainly. So I know we did talk about this earlier, and I, I wish I had a photographic memory to go back and repeat exactly what I said at that moment in time. Uh, however, we do. We have a history of trying to work with applicants to get to a point where we can recommend approval on something. In this case, the rules do say you you have to meet both criteria in order to get a well. And unfortunately, we also require uh, domestic service if if we can connect to it to come through the city to help us manage our water system, as well as to pr protect the uh, public health and safety and welfare of having potential contaminated water in the future. So it's uh, that's why we're here this evening, uh, because we were not able to get to a point where we could uh, agree upon serving uh, from city water, but uh, that doesn't preclude the applicant from presenting anything in the future that we would evaluate at that time. One of the things I asked you about had to do with whether or not the the straw would go into our aquifer, and there, we had a little bit of discussion as to to the implications of that. Can you maybe expand upon that? Does that trigger your memory a little bit? Certainly. Certainly. So the uh, the reports do say that the well would be placed outside of our aquifer. Uh, we do know that water is fluid, uh, quite literally sometimes, uh, and what we don't want to see is ever uh, an instance where, similar to uh, seawater intrusion from our groundwater basin, uh, where we start actually sucking water back into a different aquifer because of overconsumption. Got it. Thank you very much. Um, Councilmember Barnich, I see there's a follow-up. Yep. Uh, just a question, and maybe Mr. Taylor can answer this. Uh, I didn't ask it prior because I just, I thought of it, but then it I uh, wanted to have some more clarification on it. Um, regarding uh, wells that are, I guess, in the city limits, I know there's not many of them, or outside the city limits, the water quality, I know with our water that comes through the city's water system, it's very, um, uh, you know, it's treated, it's monitored, uh, we get that report. Um, that's you know almost hard to read because it has all these different contaminants and and what percentage there is or isn't etc. So as far as a well, um, who makes sure how, who monitors the um, the safety of that water? Hello, Mr. Taylor. Good evening. I am Shane Taylor, utilities manager. Uh, good to be here. Um, it's a good question. So uh, private wells. There are very few in the city limits, but there are areas where we're unable to serve just due to our infrastructure. Um, County Environmental Health mm -hmm. actually oversees that. Um, when you drill a well, then you have to have certain analysis done. That's called the Title 22 analysis. Organics, inorganics, heavy metals, uh, volatile organics, radioactivity. Um, it has to meet certain maximum contaminant levels. And then depending on the size of the system, for example, there's small water companies all throughout the county. And depending on varying degrees of how many people they serve, um, the government oversight. Private little well like this probably could be served, once it passed its initial test, it'd be up to the property owner to assure that they have good water. All I can tell you is um, we're in a situation right now, not we, but mobile home parks on the south end of Halcyon are clamoring to get off their wells because of contamination. The town of Halcyon is trying to get off their wells and they're, the wells in this area I can just say that there's numerous times over my career, people in that Prince Canyon have called me and said, Shane, can, can I hook up? You know, they wanna get on our water. So um, the water quality is not the best out there. We have two wells in the Pismo formation. We have to treat both of those for manganese, iron, and hydrogen sulfide. 
But once we treat it, it's, it's good, good water, but it has to be treated. Not sure what their water quality would be on this well because they haven't drilled it. But there's a good chance there'd be some possible treatment, at least from what I've seen. Uh, I know the school, Coastal Christian School, they've got a well out in that area. Um, so, but that's the oversight is County, uh, Slow County Health on small systems like this or private wells. Okay, thank you, Shane. You're welcome. Thank you. Any other follow-ups? No, thank you. Okay, so at this time we'd like to invite the applicant or their representative to come up and do their, their portion. And before you begin and before we begin, begin your timer, um, I'd just like to just, I don't know if caution is the right word, but um, the council has read everything that you have given us up until the, what, the submission today. So don't feel like you need to go back through everything point by point uh, just to be conservationist with your time. Um, and kind of hate your highlights. And again, um, don't feel like you have to spell it out for us, uh, things that you've already spelled out for us in other, in other documents. We've been here before. So um, you kind of can kind of take it from there. So uh, if you would, you see that there's a timer right next to you. It'll have some lights to catch you um, and it'll give you a 30 second yellow. So um, what? can I clarify? It is a three minute timer, but I'll reset it um, so that you have the full six minutes. Great, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you for at least giving me six minutes. Um, so the question, I, there's some questions, uh, there are some comments. No, no well has ever been denied by the city council. So uh, that, that I'm aware of, I, of course, everything is with, with that caveat. Um, I'm not aware of any well application that, that had an actual development plan uh, submitted with it as well. So that doesn't really seem to be uh, relevant. The other thing is that um, if you go back, and I brought this up before, the fact is that initially between the very beginning and March 20th, the city staff focused almost exclusively on what the feasibility and the cost and all these issues are from my perspective. And we provided all of that information. They haven't provided that to you. So that's a good question. Why don't they provide you all the information? Shouldn't the city council have all of the information that's available so that you can make a reasoned, fair decision uh, based on the facts, not just back based on the one, the only, the one alternative that city staff has provided you. Uh, and the fact of the matter is there was a staff report that was written that did recommend approval for the consent agenda. And why isn't that being presented? The, the, in fact, your administrative policy manual says that they're supposed to provide you the alternatives, all the alternatives and all the information that's available. And that's been withheld from you and it's been withheld from me. So I can't get that information, I've never gotten it. But there is no question that, 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 that it was going to be approved. And I'm not saying that was a final decision and it actually doesn't even really matter because the decision is yours. You're the ones who make the decision, not the city staff. But the city staff is so focused on just one alternative instead of providing you all the information that's available. Why can't I get city water on noise? Why don't we extend the main long noise? Why don't we, ex you know, there's a possibility that easements could be granted and you could extend the city main across my properties. And then of course there is the water main up there. And, and yeah, I can connect that. It's gonna cost me $300,000. I've submitted uh, an arborist report. I've submitted a report for the actual cost to bore from the bottom up. And I've also submitted um, the information that allows, you know, the, uh, the estimates that for uh, trenching. But again, we're just ignoring like the city tree program. I mean, there are thousands of oak trees, protected oak trees on this property. And no one has come out to see it. I've invited the mayor and I invited the interim city manager and Neither of them chose to do it. I invited uh, my district uh, person to come out and see my property as well. She never even replied to me. So I haven't gotten the kind of, I think, response and consideration that you would expect to get from your local, you know, Democrat, you know, elected government. And, okay, you're shaking your head, but why? Anyway, I think that I should have the access to be able to provide you the information. And that's not six minutes of time after all the time that we've taken I've, t I've said before the average time is 41 days between uh between application and and you guys actually voting and we're, we're we're over a year now and there's a reason and it's because it hasn't been a transparent and open process i asked at the time in fact after the approval 
staff report was written, I then got an email that said that, they dis that, that they, the city staff has decided it's not in the best interest of the city. Well, that's not the city code. And in fact, the city code that they're looking at, what they're basically telling you is that the city code is that if we can pr place a water meter anywhere on the property, it does not matter the size of the property, it does not matter the topography of the property, nothing else matters. If they can put a, a, a water meter there, then my well will be denied. And that sounds very ministerial to me. That doesn't sound like any discretion whatsoever. And so if you are really supposed to consider all of the you know, all the factors and weigh them, then, you know, you would be, you'd be looking at all the information that we've provided. And in fact, you would be looking at the information that we provided city staff, which they, you know, they requested from us and we provided it to them. Where is it? You, I don't think you've seen it. And, you know, why not? That doesn't make any sense. What are they hiding? You know, where is that report? You know, has it been deleted? It was distributed for final review. And I assume, like most places, you use email and it gets distributed. Well, I put in a public records request. There was no exemption that was identified that would allow them to withhold it, but I didn't get it. Um, anyway, the, the, uh, we believe that the denial of the well application will result in undue hardship. I told you it's hundreds of thousands of dollars for me to connect. I guarantee that no one here in this room has spent anywhere even close to that to, be, to connect to city water. And it's the only option I would have. And you know, the other part of it, if you look at the denial, the denial, you look at the benefits, look closely at the benefits. Who are the benefits to? You know, is there a benefit to any citizen of Royal Grande? Is, it, is there a benefit to the environment? Is there a benefit to anyone? No, there isn't. The only benefit is that the city staff gets to exert their power and say that, say that you know, we forced them to connect even though that's never happened before. And if you compare any other vacant parcel that's in the housing element, you'll see they're all simple. They already have water in the street. No one would ever drill a well. But would any of those people be, be willing to spend $300,000 to connect to city water? They won't. And anyway, my last thing would be about the balancing. So there is no benefit. According to city staff, there is no disadvantage. So look at my parcel, go look at it, look at the costs we've said, there's, there's definite hardship. And I think you should evaluate that hardship before you make a decision. And I'm out. Don't, don't walk away yet. Let's make sure that okay. nobody has questions okay. for you. Sure. So hold on sure. just a moment. And I'm, I've been dutifully writing down your questions because I'm going to ask staff those questions to respond to them. So, so hang on just one second. Yes, please do. So we, we do actually have extensive information from you in our in our record from Cleef and some other. So so yeah. what's not in the record that was in the staff report tonight that you provided to the city that you then I guess didn't include in the fifteen hundred pages yeah, you sent that's, today. Sorry, sorry, and I, I'm sorry I'm hard of hearing. So okay. um, I, I could hear you, but I couldn't hear a lot of the stuff that was happening before. Um, so the thing that's not included is that is that staff report that was distributed for final review which approved the well which recommended approval for the well that's that's there yeah that i mean that is it everything else i mean wait, well you said stuff the information that you provided them so i i wanted to know what information you provided them that we didn't get that that's something produced by staff that's staff's work product yeah what did you produce that we're not seeing because I, I, for instance, I don't know. I, what, I, I believe I saw a cost estimate, and I thought it said twenty three thousand dollars to do something. I maybe I misread it, but I thought yeah. that was the cost from okay. Cleve. Can I okay. respond to that? Yeah. So what hey, happened? You what, know what? Just for the benefit of everyone, if you could let each other finish each other's sentences, that would be really helpful. So, please continue. But let's let's take turns for everyone who's trying to follow along. Okay. So the initial. Uh, estimate that was provided, we were told initially that we're going to get the well. And they just needed some cost information to justify the recommendation. So we hired, uh, we got a bid from Larry Nash Construction, and that was in the most favorable conditions. No rock, forget about the trees. You're, you, don't, you don't have to worry about trees at all. Uh, no rock, no trees, no slope, none of that stuff. So just give us your, you know, the cheapest bid you can give us. Given the best circumstances, that was what that bid was. And we've submitted an additional bid that now, because we know 
we know things that we didn't know before, like, for example, the topography of the site, and we know that there is no chance we're getting, we're getting a, a trench for $97,000. Okay, so, so that was the missing item was the staff report and be, because the, 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 the one report is in there. I, I didn't see a report that said $97,000 either. Now it's possible I missed it, but is that another cost estimate that we should have had and don't? Yes, you should have had it. We gave it to city staff. They didn't give it to you. So that's the one thing that's missing. No, no, that, that's not the one thing that's okay, but missing. That's the question. What what is the one? What is missing? What, what are the multiple things that are missing? Okay, there's an arb. I've submitted all this information. That's why there's so much, and some of it is. I mean, I'm not going to waste your time explaining why not all of the information is relevant. I just can't break it all up. But what's missing is what's missing is all of the emails back and forth from, between the city and myself and Richard. Um, what's missing is the arborist report, which we submitted. Uh, what's missing is the uh, bid for the boring from the bottom of the, of the parcel up to the water meter. And what's missing is the updated estimate from Larry Nass Construction. Um, so it's all related to cost is what you're saying? Yeah, I'm saying that ultimately everything is related to cost. No, even I meant the missing issues. documents. If you'd let me finish. Yeah. What was that? The missing documents. I just I just gave you some of them. I'm not I weren't really prepared to tell you all of them. I mean, I've put everything that I could in the record. So I, I'm not prepared here to I just told you a bunch of them. And yes, they're related to cost. Okay, so in that fifteen hundred pages that you submitted today, yeah. that's the complete record. That would that would cover everything you're saying is missing so that we can see that. Is that what you're, is that why that came in today? It came in because it's relevant and that if I want to have any appeal rights that I have to get everything in the record. That's so every, my understanding. So everything is in the record as of 438 this afternoon. Uh, I'm not going to make a comment that everything is a record. I'm not sure. I think it's, I think it's pretty complete. I don't think there's much more that could be out there. It would be things that I don't have access to. I, okay, so I want to be clear as to why I'm asking the question. You're asserting that there's missing documents that you've submitted that, that are not somehow in the record. We are asking you what's missing, and then a pile of things also came in. So I am trying to understand the purpose of the 1,500 pages that came in, and I want to be sure that when the council gets to its deliberation process, that we have the relevant, not necessarily, not necessarily the entire record, but the relevant information in order for us to make a decision. So what I'm asking you is, with that submission, is there anything else you're going to be giving us? Uh, not that I can think of. Okay. Yeah, I believe, I believe all the relevant information has been included. Okay, thank you. And does that answer your question as well? Let, let me ask one thing, because I did glance through it. Is the Arborist Report in those 1,500 pages? Yes. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, any questions? Thank you, and so the boring estimate would also be there and the updated estimate from Larry Nesser, sorry, is it Larry Nesser? Yes. Okay, and I, I believe we've seen, we've actually got the emails, so. Um, did you did you see the staff report that you're talking about? Which, which staff report? I think a large part of your concern is that there was a staff report or a draft staff report that you felt said one thing, possibly different from what's being recommended now. And so my question is, did you see that staff report? No, although I did request it um, multiple times and formally with a public records request. Okay, I'm sorry you did say that you had requested records, so it's not in the 1500 pages, but everything else is. Right, o only the things that I have access to are in what I submitted. Yeah. Well, that makes sense, okay, thank you. Sure. All right. Um, my question is, why are you doing this before you're doing an application for the structures? Well, that, that's actually pretty easy because I need to have water, and if I can't get water, then I can't build on that site. Okay. Um, and where are your other co uh, utilities connecting from? Uh, well, I contacted PG&E. That was my first step, actually, and they, that will come off of Noise Road near the driveway to uh, the parcel. 
And so that's that's really the only other utility that's required. Well, the other one, of course, is sewer, but then I would encourage you to look at the city code for sewer and see how different that is from what city staff is presenting about water. It's also in my report that- Okay, well, we're not considering through. sewer tonight. That's kind of the point, is we're only considering water. That, that was my question, is if you wanted us to consider the whole of the project, then we would have a project in front of us. No, in fact, the, the whole point of what I did prior to purchasing the property was to make sure it would not be discretionary. So I really don't wanna bring my development project for a single family home in front of city council to be approved when it's not required. So the zoning says that I don't have to get discretionary review on my project. And I'm not, I'm not saying this applies to every single thing. I'm just talking about, I mean, you can ask Andrew Perez. He's the one who told me that. Okay, so what, I think you, maybe you missed the point of my question, but that's okay. So I'll, I'll just suspend that for now. So if you would take your seat, I, think I have follow-up questions for staff that are related to the questions that you asked. So, um, what's that? No. Um, <laughs> so, public comment has not opened. So I have a number of questions. I'm going to ask them one by one, and I'd kind of like to try and keep it corralled if I could. So the first question, I'm a, I, this isn't in a particular order, and unfortunately my pen is running out of ink, so I'm having trouble reading my own handwriting. Um, Brian, let's start with, thank you. Why were the emails uh, and other items not included in the report well so we have so the the applicant is referring to a, um, a staff report I, I guess that um, that is part of our preliminary uh, review of the preliminary and final review of the project so with any project uh, we go through uh, reviews at staff level up to director up to the city manager, depending on the project. Um, and so those are all drafts. They're, um, they're not, not public until the final draft is sent and provided to the city council or the planning commission or whoever the, the body is, as well as the public. Um, so so the, ref the reference is to a report that was just an internal, uh, you know, part of our discussion you know, there, there are multiple uh, reports and edits and things going on just like with any project. Uh, so that we, wouldn't, we would not release those to the public. They're, they're part of our draft process. In the same way that these notes that I'm taking here are not subject to public records request either because they're part of my deliberative process. Sure. Right. And so in the same sense, and again, I'm trying to, to make this understandable for the public, that when we circulate uh, uh, an internal staff report for review at multiple people starting within community development, ending up at the city manager's desk, all of that is considered the, the, the deliberative process until that final one is, is put forth and published. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so then in terms of why that's not been provided, Isaac, um, can you just be a little bit more clear about that? I'm gonna ask the question even though I already know the answer, that why is that not being provided as public part of a public records request? Well, I can't speak to the specific record, um, but the city produced pursuant to state law, all records that are disclosable under the Public Records Act and that are responsive. So, um, Well, what I'm asking is, is an internal draft before publication considered part of the deliberative process and thus not responsive? There are a series of exemptions that could apply to a, to a draft document. Um, and the city would have articulated any rationale for any documents it withheld as part of its response to the PRA but I'm sure the city completed a robust process in finding and disclosing all responsive records. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, back to Director Pedrotti. Um, it said that, the, that at the beginning there was consideration of cost of the applicant, but then that changed. Can you explain that or comment on that? Um, there was some discussion about um, 
cost the applicant had identified that um, there would be significant cost to them. Um, they had asked us for information about how much the cost would be uh, to extend um, our, from our water line to the property boundary. Uh, so we did provide, I think um, the utilities manager did provide that cost. That's, um, that is also, uh, I think, part of the record. Um, but initially there were, there were some discussions about, um, about costs just in general because the applicant was doing a comparison, I think, with um, what they felt was, you know, extending lines to their proposed building sites, um, which we, again, we don't have any information about where those building sites would be. The question was, the assertion was in terms of a question from the applicant's presentation that city staff focused on applicant's cost and then changed that point of view. No, we did not focus, we haven't focused on costs on wells um, in general. Uh, before 2017, I think we had uh, some of the applications identified that we were talking about metering costs to, to wells. Um, but there has not been a general concern about cost uh, okay. on this well. And Isaac, I'm going to ask you kind of a follow up on that. Um, does it matter? Oh, um, well, I'm glad you asked, Mayor, just because I wanted to uh, sort of um, uh, articulate or piggyback off what Mr. Pedrotti said. Um, and to your question uh, and to Mr. Pedrotti's point, uh, no, pre-2017, the city did look at uh, some costs related to the applicant. Those were in the, um, those were specific to agricultural wells and irrigation wells that don't use potable water. And so the city has consistently, when it's looked at domestic wells, evaluated the criteria that Mr. Pedrotti raised in his PowerPoint. And all of those are within the same findings and, and the discretionary process that comes before the city council on practicality and feasibility. So the city has to treat similar properties uh, in a similar fashion, and the city's done that consistently. It hasn't looked at cost to the applicant since before 2017, uh, but only since 2017 has there been domestic wells, and at that time the city's looked at the same factors it looked at relative to this application. Well, my question is, does it matter if staff initially looked at that and then decided, oh wait, we're not supposed to look at that, or something like that as part of the process? I understand. Uh, that's correct. They that's part of their due diligence and fact finding to ask questions and to try to get the information necessary to make their recommendation. Uh, and ultimately, they made the recommendation of denial based on sort of the factors that the city as an organization looks at. And it ultimately comes for the council then to, to decide whether they agree with that, um, that due diligence. Thank you. Um, and Director Pagrati, why was a recommended approval not provided? Um, in other words, it, there apparently, the, the assertion was there was a recommended approval internally and then that was not provided to us. So can you uh, explain that? Yeah, there was never a recommendation for approval. Um, I think that there was a, um, an email to the applicant uh, from one of our staff members um, that identified that it's looking positive or something like that. Um, but at that point, uh, the review wasn't complete. We hadn't uh, completed our final review. Um, and so, um, again, that wasn't a recommendation for approval. Okay, and why isn't uh, there, I, I didn't quite get this full question, but why isn't there a main on Noyes or why isn't something coming forward, coming from Noyes Road? And I see our public works director leaning forward. Okay, thank you. Um, we don't have a main there. We have a main uh, that is in the equestrian um, road area, but we don't have a main that uh, follows the noise um, segment. And so I think the question was implying, why wouldn't we do that? Um, because we don't have any uh, houses to serve there. There's not, not a large uh, segment of homes. Uh, it would be very expensive for us to just pull a main line there um, uh, really for no for no for no reason or for a smaller uh, development okay and um, I guess to director Pedrotti are, are we ignoring our tree ordinance 
uh, we are not um, ignoring our, our community tree community tree program. Um, as, as we described, uh, the director at the time an application comes in for development, uh, the director of public works has the ability to issue permits for uh, removal or, or impact trees. So, um, And then this is a question that I wrote down as a sort of a response to the, the concern that this has taken over a year. But I know your, your uh, presentation sort of addressed the timing here. But can staff kind of comment on, on why it's taking so long to get through this process? Uh, 1,500 pages given today notwithstanding? Um, well, there was, um, there was a lot of uh, initial um, discussion with the applicant just about uh, what is allowed on the property, zoning, and things like that. Um, once the application came in, uh, staff, um, staff processed it in the normal manner. Um, and then once uh, we've had, I guess, quite a few continuances since um, it was initially um, expected to go to a hearing. Um, so that's been an, an obviously an additional time, but um, I don't I don't believe that the well application being a discretionary approval similar to um, you know a, a minor use permit or a condition conditional use permit approval. Uh, some of these things can take time because we're looking at multiple factors. Um, clearly, there's a lot um, to the decision to be made with a with a well um, within city boundaries. And so a lot of that just had to do with sort of the review and then uh, the applicant's uh, response time as well. Uh, then there was a question about why we're not following our own code. Can you decipher that or? No, I, I think believe we're following our, our code. Okay. Um, then there were a few things at the end here. Um, Again, why is there no disadvantage in the staff report? As in, we have advantages, but no disadvantage. Why is the, the applicant's hardship not considered in the disadvantages portion? Um, have to take a look at the staff report really quick. Mayor. Yes. I do believe that's just a pure oversight on the uh, agenda preparers part. Okay, so um, thank you. Uh, Mayor, I do have one follow up on that just to say, I think to the point raised by applicant regarding the options and sort of the disadvantages that uh, the city staff did provide the alternatives certainly and, and tried to reiterate in the staff report that it is council's discretion to, to conduct the hearing. Uh, and hear from applicant directly, wh who has a contrary position from from city's position and recommendation in, in the staff report in order to uh, to hear sort of both sides uh, beyond staff's position. Thank you. And the alternative two is reject staff's recommendation denying the installation of one new domestic supply well. Correct. So, all right, thank you for that. And um, I don't know this, I, I sort of asked this question prior to the applicant's presentation, but Director Pedrotti, um, what's the benefit, the, 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 the comment was there's no benefit to the citizens and no benefit to the environment for this. Can you explain what the benefit or what the consideration for the citizenship at large is here? And the, and the environmental considerations. It's kind of the question I asked city manager Downing, but this is just a little more pointed. Yes, so um, the, the benefit to the city is that um, we generally have a policy of when properties um, are developed, they are connected to water, to city water service. Um, I think I alluded to sort of the management uh, from the city of our water source basically um, including all of the conservation measures and um, the cash for grass programs and things like that. Um, in some ways, uh, the, the benefit is an equity issue in terms of all the users in the city. Um, and when 
city service is, can be connected, um, then the city wants to connect those properties. In the cases where it's too far away, um, you have to cross multiple properties. Um, we have shown that the city would allow a well in the city, within the city boundaries um, based on the practical and feasible, feasibility standard in the, in, the, um, in the code. And then the environment? Um, well, it's a, kind of the same, um, sort of in the same vein. Um, from a water conservation standpoint, uh, from uh, the ability to provide water, um, you know, the, the um, interplay between uh, groundwater aquifers, um, so there's a lot of factors in there that, um, that, that should be considered. And so Manager Downey, you look like you're itching to say you something. Say something else. I would just reiterate, it's, uh, it, it's for the city to be able to manage its overall water portfolio and our water sources, also protect uh, public health and safety from uh, either contamination on site or down, downstream contamination. And, um, Finally, this is just for my own knowledge because I didn't even think to ask this question until just now. It's probably for Bill um, or perhaps Brian. What does the code say about how deep you have to bury a water main? So the plumbing code uh, talks about a water service at 18 inches below. Okay. So uh, it's somewhere in there. Some people do it two feet, but that's, the, that's to meet the code compliance. Okay. Thank you. That's just my own... Well, yeah, please do. Actually, a follow up, but it was along that same vein. Um, though, as far as the water main, I know there was a photo that was in the staff report of where it would connect to. Um, how? Um, what's the diameter of the water line? Was it nine inches? Uh, are you talking about the water line that you saw in the picture? Well, I guess I'm just talking of? about when you put in a water line, how, how what's the, the, the depth I just heard, but the, um, the size of sure. the trench and then the size of the pipe. So the size of the pipe that comes off the eight inch line that you saw mm -hmm. uh, is going to be a one inch line. And then, uh, then the applicant or uh, someone would come off normally with a two inch line, uh, taking into consideration friction and issues that uh, come down down the line so uh, we were talking about a one inch line above ground going under ground that you saw uh, on on the picture and then uh, going on to the property it would be a two inch line a two inch diameter pipe that goes underground that's that's what the trenching would involve and make room for that's right okay and then 18 inches or two feet i guess so I'm guessing when you're digging this trench, I guess I was picturing a giant trench, but from what size of a trench? I mean, 18 inches deep, but four um, inches? So, excuse me? Four inches? <laughs> no, no, not four inches. It would be wider than that. And, okay. Uh, but it's the size of the bucket that you use. You could use a, a mini excavator with a two-foot bucket, and so the width of the trench could be two feet and the depth of the trench could be two feet or 18 inches, somewhere in there. Okay, thank you for that. And I have a question for Isaac. So Isaac, the, the words undue hardship were used at the end of the presentation. Can you address the, the kind of consider, the legal considerations from the city's point of view in terms of undue hardship? I presume that was stated for a reason. Well, I would say it's not part of the findings we make specific to the well application. So. Uh, an undue hardship might in a different context mean something specific, although um, generally it's not something that comes up in my practice. Um, so I think an undue hardship might be relevant, certainly from an applicant's point of view relative to as well application, but it's not within our code for how the city makes a recommendation for whether or not it would approve a new domestic well. I'm asking you, does that open us up to exposure? Well, um, I think to a point applicant made on the record, you know, the, the submittal of material today shortly before the hearing was to reserve appeal rights. So, you know, we wouldn't, we certainly wouldn't opine on applicants next steps or, or what he's okay. thinking, but. Got it. All right. So that, that speaks to a potential uh, 
continuance to take a look at those things. All right. Any yes. Yes. <laughs> Lots Thank of you. questions. I have a few. <laughs> um, so there's there's been um, some statements made that I think maybe we could possibly be clarified a little, especially for the public. Um, and I'm not sure who to ask, but I so I'll start with Director Parat. Padrati, and you then can tell me if I should be talking to um, someone else. But so there's been talk. Um, you responded that there's a benefit to the city for folks hooking up to city water, and you said uh, I have a policy where generally, paraphrasing, where the city water hooked up. Um, that's that's a policy you try to have in place. And then you mentioned water conservation and the concept of equity, and I actually. Just to clarify, when, you, when you're talking about equity in terms of the water supply, are you talking about the fact that our residents using city water have to follow pretty strict water guidelines when they're watering, how much it costs, turf regulations you mentioned, and those are when we've restricted the amount of lawn that can be put in, if at all, to new houses, things like that, because of the water it uses? Is, is that what you meant? That's exactly right. Okay. Um, yeah, we have outdoor watering days um again the tiered pricing um all of those all of those um those different restrictions uh, and limitations that apply to city water tiered pricing for residents that are paying for different amounts of water depending on well i guess depending on how much they're using right okay right it goes to um city managers uh downing's um discussion about managing the portfolio i just um, thank you i just was trying to kind of flush that out a little bit. Um, and then, and I'm sorry, I don't remember who I would be speaking to about this, but you, somebody brought up uh, depleting aquifers, aquifers, and we come under the Santa Maria aquifer, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, and so I know in the, in the latest staff report and recommendation, I think there's a finding or a comment that, um, that Mr. Harris as well wouldn't, would be outside of that. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, but then, then what I'm hearing, and I forget, I'm sorry, who said it tonight, whether it was Shane or one of you, that um, that's, that's a, it's a poor word, but fluid situation where water supplies can shift in aquifers. So that is still a risk that a well on his land could potentially take water from, quote, our aquifer? I think it's a potential risk. Um, we don't have, uh, you know, that would need to be determined by a hydrogeologist. Um, uh, to determine whether or not pulling from one aquifer would impact another one. So it, it, it's it's something that happens. It does um, happen sometimes. It happens sometimes in aquifers, um, but we don't have any particular evidence between these two these two aquifers that that's occurring. Okay, and I just, I hadn't seen that detail in the report, so I just wanted to clarify that for everyone. Um, and um, Council Member Seacrest, uh, City Manager Downing asked, oh, answered that question, and one of the things he spoke about besides pulling from it was actually putting into it. It was contamination risk. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to keep track here. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. And then for the sake of transparency, and I'm not trying to be problematic here, but there's been some talk about emails and some emails were provided to us, which I understand to be emails between Mr. Harris and some of the staff initially. Is that correct? Um, that's correct. Okay, and so I know there's been, I think I understand, and there's been discussion that after 2017, I'm not sure if you're saying you've ever looked at the expense of, of the applicant, but not after 2017 for sure. Am I straight on that? Correct. Okay, but, but would you say it was, how to put this, it was actually a mistake on the part of one staff member, some of those emails, because it looks like he said, the city council, city council would likely approve the project once you present the numbers. I, I could see how that, I'm not saying it's relevant to the ultimate decision, but I, it could explain some of the bad feeling that's going on. Does that, do you, what do you think of that? Uh, certainly. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And council member Seacrest, just one point of clarification too. I think, you know, uh, the applicant has submitted a, a significant amount of emails back and forth that were disclosed as part of the Public Records Act. I would think of that as a distinguishable process from how staff puts together its application material. So it's not customary sure. for the city to include every email with an applicant back and forth as part of a staff report. Um, but certainly emails are produced as is the city's obligation under the Public Records Act when requested. Of course, thank you. I just wanted to clarify what, since we had actually read it, I wanted, I just wanted it to be transparent. <laughs> thank you. 
Okay. Sir. Yeah. All right. So just clarification for me. We, we, we actually have wells in more than one aquifer. We have at least wells in the Pismo. In fact, don't we have two. a two, two in the wells. Pismo? Yeah. In fact, we have one rel relatively close. And, but isn't that determination already been made by, I believe, CLEAS services that, in fact, there's, well, it, I guess we made the determination, but based on the information provided by CLEAS services that there was unlikely to be uh, contamination or depletion? I mean, we, that, that's not the basis of our denial. That's correct. I just, that's I'm correct. Just, just to clarify that. All right. Yeah, and uh, Mayor Pro Tem got there. I, I, I do think that's a good point that staff's recommended denial uh, goes through both findings and is focused on the practicality and feasibility finding in terms of why they recommended denial versus the contamination finding. Thank you. Any other follow-up questions? Your mic's on. Go ahead. It is. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wasn't clear on what Mayor Pro Tem Guthrie was saying. When you say we have wells in Pismo, what does that mean? Like We, we have wells in the Pismo formation. Uh, the city are, of AG not, does? We, 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 yeah, okay, thank yeah, you. That, that are not part of the Santa Maria aquifer. Okay, thank you. Okay. Again, explaining process here. So council has asked its questions. The next couple steps of the process is I'm going to open up public comment. Public comment will include anyone who has not spoken. So Mr. Harris, if you want to have your other people come on up, you can wave them up. Uh, anyone else who would like to speak on this item, um, so we'll do that, we'll check in online, and then we'll close public comment and then deliberation will come back to the council at that time. And at that time, that's the time for the public to listen to us at that point. So we haven't given any commentary yet. We won't do that until after we hear from the public. So at this time, I'll open up public comment. Would anyone like to speak on this item? <coughs> Just to clarify. I'm not one of Mr. Harris's people. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Dean Verta. My wife, Pam, and I live at 521 Torrey Pine Place, located just to the north and adjacent to Mr. Harris's property. Since we, since we purchased our property 25 years ago, we have monitored activity at the subject property as we share more than 500 feet of common property line. <clears throat> We're puzzled by the current status of Mr. Harris's well application. The primary focus of the resolution presented tonight seems to be concerned the practicality and feasibility, we've heard that a lot tonight, of the well permit. Since requiring Mr. Harris to connect to the city water service, is deemed practical and feasible for the city, the city staff is recommending a no vote. This decision gives no consideration to the practicality and feasibility for the applicant and places a very significant burden on Mr. Harris to comply with the city's rejection of his well request. Considering that allowing him to drill his own well has absolutely no stated consequence of any kind to the city, yet denial of his well permit causes great harm to one of your citizens. We question whether the staff is fully informed of the tremendous construction costs and financial burden this action places on Mr. Harris, or is aware of it, and for some reason chooses to harm him. We would like to believe that the city of Rio Grande would present it with a situation that has no impact on it, would not choose to purposely take such action against one of its own citizens, and would, whenever practical and feasible for all involved, take steps to avoid such a situation. We're asking each of you to thoroughly and thoughtfully consider your decision before you vote tonight. To be clear, Mr. Harris did not ask us to speak on his behalf, nor do we have any interest in his property. We're just curious why the city's taking this stance. Thank you. Thank you. Come on up. 
Good evening. My name is Lynn Sarah Carstairs, and I'm one of the original owners of the property up above Mr. Harris's uh, property. And when we bought our home uh, 22 or 23 years ago, we, it was disclosed that, that uh, those properties were zoned for housing of some kind. So we knew that someday uh, something would move forward. Um, what interests me is the fact that I have uh, looked at that property from above for all of those years, and there's significant wildlife that um, traipses through there. There's everything from bobcats to coyotes and deer, um, flocks of turkeys, etc. And there are these outcroppings of rocks, and they're very significant. We have some on our own property. I have, a, I have one of the larger lots. I have a third of an acre. And so not only is it a situation that digging a trench would um, alter these wildlife corridors and destroy much of the oak trees because their roots would be harmed. And if you looked down from above, it was a beautiful area of photo. It's a very dense oak forest. And I'm really here because I was mostly concerned about my view corridor and I never saw you know, where this house is going to be going. And I appreciate all the pros and cons of, of all of this, but I'd like to preserve my ocean view. But um, I really think that uh, the blasting of this rock uh, we're on a canyon. I can hear parties across the valley on the other side of Noyes Road when there's a party in the evening. The blasting of rock, the digging that would be required to make this significant trench is something that I think all of my neighbors would prefer to, uh, prefer to avoid on both sides of Noyes Road. We lose our trees. We have butterflies. We have um, migrating birds. We have all kinds of things that go through um, that 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 area and I've seen it for 23 years so if anybody knows what's going on down there I do and I'd appreciate if you wouldn't destroy the trees and you wouldn't have us listen to blasting rock etc it destroys our quality of life and I don't think a Roy Grandy wants to do that so I think a well should be drilled I don't want to hear a well being drilled either but I don't want it, the trees and the wildlife destroyed it would be a, a real real shame to have that happen thank you My name is Pam Berto, and I appreciate that Mike wants to keep the property as natural as he can. It's beautiful. If you guys would take the time to come out and see it for yourself, you'd see what he's talking about. Drilling a, a well would be so much better just for the whole environment, the wildlife, everything. And, and he's trying to save trees, which we all appreciate, right? Thank you. Hello, just taking this all in. I have no dog in the fight, um, but just kind of list, listening to it all. Um, I had a couple questions. Um, so I guess there's two kind of requirements when you're applying for a well, um, it can't deplete and it can't contaminate. That's the first one. And then the second one, um, it needs to be practical or feasible or, yeah, it can't be practical or feasible. And if it's not for the city, then they can do the well. Um, so I guess my question, um, I mean, you know, the reservoir seems pretty obvious that it's like right next to his property. So it seems pretty practical and feasible. So I guess my question would be, um, why wasn't it like a quicker process of denial if, you know, it seems pretty practical or feasible just based looking at the map. Um, and then why did he have to do like a feasibility test if it wasn't practical or feasible? So those are my questions. Thank you. And um, just to let the public know, um, when the public is asking these questions, I'm taking some notes, and we'll ask those at the end of public comment. Is there anyone else who would like to come forward? And I'm sorry. I'm going to actually ask you to yell from the back. Your second question, your first one was, why wasn't it quicker? Oh, why was he required to produce a feasibility? Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Richard Birdie, and <clears throat> I've been hired by... Uh, Mike Harris uh, on the civil engineering side. Um, I own a company called Slow Civil Design, operates out of San Luis Obispo. Um, I want to first push back on 
uh, something that Brian mentioned about uh, there's no you know proposed structures you know uh, as a part of this application. Um, I've done many projects within this, the county, especially, and there are it's routine to have wells drilled and constructed prior to being sold for you know ultimate development. So securing water rights is is for sure something that's not out of the ordinary, especially on a property that's this size. Um, and also, uh, the I think that what's implied with the um, the statement that, that there's no structure being proposed is that somehow the cost estimates or the impacts that would be to the land are speculative. Um, if you look at the map of the of the property and where all the trees are located up there at the top, um, along with the rocks and everything else, I think that it's very reasonable to to state that any viable building site would be outside of that uh, that area on those slopes that are in excess of 30% with the exposed rock outcropping with known sandstone and amongst uh, fully developed oak groves. Um, the distance to any viable build site is at least 800 feet in any direction. So uh, um, just with those trenching costs for, if you just, you can go to like Caltrans, uh, you know, cost estimates that you guys I'm sure are, are use for uh, cost estimates that are for projects in the in the public right of way and they have standard trenching and utility installation costs, you know, they, they range from, you know, 150 up, uh, per linear foot up. Um, so even if we use those costs, we're talking about, you know, over $100,000 to connect. If we're talking about trenching through exposed uh exposed rock and um the, the the impacts to the tree i believe from my understanding that the tree ordinance if you have an impact to the tree that there's a financial obligation for that as well um the arborist report states that there would be up to 250 trees impacted that's a huge cost there uh so the difference between just in in cost terms are are hundreds of thousands of dollars and i don't think that there's any question about that regardless of what viable build site we would decide on in the future um, the other uh, the other thing is that the trench that we're talking about would not be able to be constructed with a t traditional backhoe and, and bucket. Uh, the slopes would you know would pr present challenges, and also the tree ordinance, from my understanding, requires hand digging around oak trees. So you would be pneumatically drilling with a jackhammer, most likely, to get through that rock. So that's what I would say. Would anyone else like to speak? All right, uh, I have two things that I'm I'm a little concerned about with this application. Uh, one part was maybe it can't be considered, but it was interesting to me that he had called out that he had chosen the property specifically to avoid being a project. That rose a flag in regards to uh i've been i've been here when people brought projects up to planning commission so it it doesn't seem like that provides a new uh, hardship so that did catch my interest on why that would be a stated goal but also the aquifer he might be tapping into might not be our aquifer but aquifers go between towns. And I do think it's important that we be good neighbors when it comes to aquifers, because ultimately, if someone's pulling water from it, you know, they they need that water to be there. Anyone else? Okay, seeing no one here, we'll check in online. If any members of the public on Zoom would like to make a comment, please raise your hand. There are no raised hands. Thank you. Um, so we've got two questions that um, came from the public. The first one is, um, if it is so feasible to do this, why wasn't it a quicker process to get to the denial? Brian, you want to, uh, excuse me, Director Pedrati, you want to address that? Um, yeah, I, I think that's a fair question. Um, it probably could have been quicker. Um, I don't know that this process was perfect um, in terms of process, um, but it, it did go through the process. Um, and 
Um, I think early on, um, we, uh, the city did provide some information about it being um, problematic to drill a well here. Um, the applicant wanted to pursue it, and so um, staff engaged in that and eventually um, got to this process. But um, I, I, do, I do think that it, it certainly could have been a quicker, uh, quicker process. And, it, and also, why was he asked to provide a feasibility report if, again, the determination was that the staff was going to recommend denial? And I don't know what feasibility report was being referred to, but maybe you do. No, I, I'm not sure exactly what uh, what that is, but we could uh, maybe get clarification on that. Okay. I don't know that we need it, but I'm just making sure that we do that piece of the due diligence. Um, I have a, a question that is just very, very simple. <laughs> and this is really what it comes down to is... I think the public that came to ask is, so what's the harm? And I'm unclear on what the harm is. I understand the decision, and I think the decision is of staff is based in, in code and pretty solid, but my question is, what's the harm? And, from the, and when I say from the city's point of view, I'm saying not from staff's point of view, from the citizen's point of view. Um, so... I understand the question. I would, I would still start with the code only because the code sort of defaults to um, city city water, right? So um, it says that properties within the city should connect, and it gives very specific reasons or criteria as to why this would be an exception to connect. One is the depletion and contamination, which I think we determined, at least at the staff level, uh, was not an issue. But then there's a reason why the code states um, that the applicant needs to make the determination that it's a practical and feasible, that it's not practical and feasible. Um, and the I think- The applicant does? Sorry, well, the, as part of the application, the application needs to essentially meet the criteria, which is the depletion contamination and then the feasible and practicality. And so um, the code sort of defaults to, again, providing water service because of some of the issues regarding water management in our portfolio and things like that. Um, I think overall, the city wants to be able to um, provide properties with city water. We don't really want um, a proliferation of wells um, within the city boundaries. Um, and overall, uh, I think w when you have a, a city boundary, um, our code reasonably states that those properties should be uh, connected to city, city water. I'm not sure you answered my question. Um, You're talking about the harm, I think. Yeah, I'm not asking you what the code says. I'm asking you the practicality. And maybe I see the city manager reaching for his mic. Um, Matt, you want to comment on this? Certainly. So I think this is one of those issues where uh, I will refer back to the code, but the code applies citywide. Uh, it doesn't look property by property. It doesn't have uh, an exception here, an exception there. I think Mr. Pedrotti's point of does the city council want a proliferation of domestic wells throughout the city where it's determined, well, to me, it's it's impractical and not feasible because it costs me too much money. Um, I'm not saying that's not a valid point if, if in the future the council decides that's the way we want to go. But our rules are crafted to apply universally citywide. That's how we have the ability to create those rules, right? Um, and so what's the harm is it's the downstream effect. It's the it's the slippery slope of we let it happen here, we let it happen another place, and then all of a sudden we have wells throughout throughout the city. And that might be an over-exaggeration or a, a gross mi misrepresentation of what might actually happen in the future. But that's the concern when these rules get put in place is to protect our residents and our, our water system from contamination and impacts to their health and safety. So 
from what I just heard you say, I want to make sure I'm I'm filtering this properly. Part of what I heard you say was um, the 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 downstream effect, and or not that was maybe I don't want to say a poor choice of words, but um, that the staff report showed that we've consistently applied that code in all of these instances. So if we make an exception now for what are understandable but arbitrary reasons that the next staff report is going to say we've been consistent except this one time and that's the problem mm -hmm. is that what you're saying that's part of the problem or the next time we get an application and we say well we did it for this property now we're proposing to let it happen for this next property which may not be as big of a cost to the applicant right that's so what i'm saying that we've we've set that right. okay we did it now but not then and i'm, I'm not yeah i wasn't i was trying not to use the word precedent because it's not a legal right. term here but is that essentially what you're essentially saying? yes okay got it and i should have asked this question before and it didn't occur to me until in real time when the applicant was speaking what's the development potential on that property i mean right now it's not subdivided but Right, it's a single family with um, ADUs, essentially. So potentially under SB 94? Uh, under SB 9, yeah, potentially under SB 9. They could get additional homes through a SB 9 subdivision. And is it is it subdividable? Um, it could be. Um, uh, to how, to? I think, I think maybe four or five. Um, I don't know that off the top of my head. So if you could subdivide that to four or five properties and multiply each one of them by four per SB9, let's call it four, that would be 16 properties, 16 residences? Yeah, potentially. Um, you can't you can't SB9 a project that's already been, a property that's already been SB9. Um, right, so but if the slot a, split happens first, right then you could potentially yes okay so so this is more the, the decision here is is affecting more than just and the economics of it is more than just a residence and an adu in terms of of economic impact i guess that's what i'm asking is when we have a development come forward and we're looking at the entirety of a project um, we would be looking at full impacts, we would be looking at CEQA, we would be looking at, at all of these things put together. And when we say how much it costs to, when we weigh as part of our decision making, how much it costs to hook up to Matt's, I think Mr. Downing, if, if I'm hearing this all right, this is part of why we're saying, why staff is saying we don't have an application that we're looking at here. So the cost is irrelevant because there is nothing to connect it to. I, I guess, I guess what I'm, I, maybe I'm, I don't mean to be slipping into commentary. I'm really asking a question. If, if you're going to average that over 16 properties, that's a different cost and it's a different calculus for whether or not it's feasible economically for the applicant, even though we're not, we're not required to look at that test. Am I, am I, and I see Isaac, if you, I see your mics on. Uh, yes, Mayor. I mean, I think that's a, that's a good way to think about it insofar as staff's recommendation is again, only based on the well application that's been submitted. So it came up in the context of arguments related to CEQA and environmental impacts or potential future development that would require a tree removal permit from the public works director based on construction or development. Um, but all staff can do is look at the application in front of it. So um, it's, I think it's fair to say staff's intent in the practicality and feasibility review was to look at the specifics with the larger policy goals in mind that city manager Downing referenced, which is that residential properties hook up to water supply, um, the city's water supply. Um, and it's hard to speculate on future development on the site. Okay, thank you. Right. Any other questions? Yes, yes hot mic over there. You. So um, I guess uh, Director Pedrotti, um, and I didn't ask this earlier because I didn't even I didn't even comprehend it until you just had that conversation. But are are you saying that po potentially sixteen residences could end up on that property? 
no. I'm, I mean, it depends on, it all depends on development applications. Of uh, course. So but, right um, now it's a single property that allows um, what I described, residents and, and ADUs essentially. Okay. And I don't know if, the, if everyone knows what SB9 is, but that's the state mandate uh, for building accessory dwelling units on lots on single family okay. residential lots yes um and i understand we're not we're not he there's nothing before us of course in terms of the development um okay so if how would that work is it possible that that this well could be approved and then the property owner could decide to apply for 16 residences i mean i guess you can tell me it would who have knows. to go through the lot split process first right Right, I'm just trying to imagine if we approve the well and then all those ADUs end up on there, could they even use the well? And then I can sort of see what the problem is with trying to decide this without knowing. So, thank you. Right, and, and right, I mean, we would, if someone came in with an application for a subdivision and requested a well for a, uh, an additional subdivision, we would go through the same process uh, in terms of practicality and feasibility and uh, depletion and contamination, but obviously the the um, evaluation would be much different with if you've got multiple lots that are being proposed in a in a type of subdivision like that. Mayor Pro Tem, you see your finger on the button. Okay, so 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 I understand the discussion about the the development potential, but our decision tonight is very specifically about the the well and whether it's practical and feasible, independent. Uh, and and so any. I just want to clarify that, I, 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 and this is a little bit of a comment, so I'm having trouble <laughs> forming it, is, is that might be a very excellent explanation of why we have this kind of a rule so that we can maintain control if, in fact, there is some change in development expectation on, on any property, particularly a big property. So I just kind of want to clarify that. What, what we're talking about isn't that, that, that we're, you know, that we're talking about the potential of the property. We're talking about the reason that we, that might be the reason <laughs> that we have this rule in place. And uh, yeah. sort of the question is, is, it, is it, you, you made the comment that we have very specific direction here. I, 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 I think that's when the problem is, is that it's really not that specific. <laughs> when you're feasible is, is, what was your father's term, weasel word, I think he used to say. Um, you know, and I'm um, I, and and so that's. I I was just wondering if, if we, if, if there's if there's more to it than we're seeing that that you know we see the specific code, but is there an explanation anywhere of feasibility, or if we went back and saw the original discussion, we would we would gain anything about what the what the intent was when when this was put in place. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, I think it's a good point, and I think overall. You're correct that the, what's before the council tonight is the well application for this one subject property. And when staff reiterates that there's not a development project that's part of that consideration, that's in part because it is a challenge to go through sort of all the different avenues or approvals that may or may not be required for a future single family home or state housing laws that, as has come up tonight, may allow a multi dwellings on the single parcel or an ADU and so staff's focus was more narrow just about you know the subject sites um, accessibility to the city's water infrastructure um, and that applicant can provide additional information as part of a, a new submittal but uh, at this time the applicant the application is for a domestic well on this on this single parcel. One more question for uh, Public Works Director Robson, because because you were with the county, the comment was made that this is done all the time in the county. Does that that they, you get the water approval and before there's an application? Does the county have a similar rule that says if you can hook up to a, a I'll call it a major water supply that you 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 have to prove that you couldn't make that that hook up before you could get a well? Do do they have a similar sort of code? Um, in place if your property is within an urban services line which means that there's a line that surrounds a community for example where there is a community service of water 
then yes, there is a requirement for those pieces of property to hook up to that service. Uh, when you're talking about a rural piece of property that's outside of the city limits or outside of the community limits, um, then um, what one of the commenters uh, categorizes is true. If you're out in a rural area, you can uh, go through and get a, a, a permit to have a well. Um, I can't recall, uh, I, I, I don't know if I agree with the categorization of just getting a domestic well and having it sit out there. I think there is a need to have some kind of connection of a residential uh, component to that, but um, it can come a little bit later, but uh, that, that's kind of the county process that, uh, that I've experienced over uh, a long period of time. So it would be fair to say that a, an urban water connection, I've forgotten exactly the language used, is very similar to being a city? That's true, yes. Okay. All right, thank you. Go ahead. Yes. Um, so, um, Isaac, the going back to your um, explanation, and I can't remember who actually asked the question, but as far as um, the potential on this piece of property, so I understand what staff was looking at when the application came in, um, but um, or the, the the well permit, but. Could, should council really be looking at this in a vacuum when we know that there is potential for um, lots more water use? Um, maybe not, maybe forever it's a single family, but they definitely can do other things on the property. What if there's a couple swimming pools? Um, I, I don't know, I'm just saying, would that be unwise for us to just sort of put the blinders on and, and not look at the potential? I guess of what could be on that property because to me that is a fair question and as I think that Karen uh, the mayor was saying that probably speaks to why the code is written the way it is. I think it's certainly not in a vacuum and the council certainly has the authority to think through what staff determines is practical and feasible in determining whether the council as a body agrees with that determination. I think to appoint city manager Downing made, the code uh, has codified sort of a, a, a concept or a preference that most domestic properties hook up to the city's water infrastructure for a series of reasons. And I would say in the past when the city's approved a domestic well, um, it's been distinguishable in part because there might have been multiple properties that ended up relying on the well. And so if it was had to be replaced, that's distinguishable from a property that could be connected to the city's water infrastructure. So I don't think the council needs to think about it um, as being in a vacuum and can consider sort of the underlying policy considerations associated with what is practical and feasible for the city and what is practical and feasible under the code. Thank you. All right, so the decision to be made now before we get to any sort of a vote is whether you, we feel that we have enough information to make a determination or whether you would like to continue this and have staff get the opportunity to look through the 1500 pages. So my recommend, no, it, Public comment is closed. That is why I explained what the process is. This is the council's determination. So I'll, I'll just begin just as the moderator of the meeting. I normally would let y'all go first, but everybody's grabbing for water, so nobody wants to talk first. My thought is I, I don't know what's in that 1,500 pages. There could only be two that are relevant to us, but until we know that answer, I would like staff to go through it and make sure that that's the case. So um, I would prefer to see, to see this continue to a date certain so that we could um, make sure that there's nothing else in there and hope that we don't get another one of these 11th hour submittals so we can actually make a decision one night. Um, I see you've got your mic on, don't yeah, touch I, it again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would agree with that, but for another reason, I do think that the, even though it is very late, that we do have significant amount of information submitted by the applicant and it'd be, Unfair, us, unfair for us to say that, oh, we don't need that information to review it. I think it's great that staff will review it as well, but I'm, so I'm definitely in favor of continuing. Right, I think it's, in my opinion, it's sort of built in, you, you, you know, if it's gonna, he's already, they've made it clear, it's gonna be part, if they appeal, 
I'd like to know what's in there if, you know, before I make a decision. Okay. Um, so uh, I did ask Jessica this or before, um, just to kind of take a look at what our upcoming uh, agendas look like. So our next a uh, couple meetings are the dates of March 12th and March, what, what would that be, 26th. Um, what do our agendas look like there that we could perhaps, I don't know, squeeze is the right word. This is not a short hearing either way, um, although it is just a continuance of deliberations. Right, and I'm going to also look at our city manager to weigh in if he needs to, but we the March 12th is a full agenda at this time. We have two business items and a public hearing. Okay. Mr. Downing? Hey, and looking at the agenda projections, I do agree with our city clerk that the March 12th meeting, uh, even because staff reports are due tomorrow, um, that's a lot of paperwork <laughs> to go through. Um, so we would be, I, I would recommend continuing to a date certain of March 26, 2024. Okay. Um, and uh, all right, so I will make a motion that we continue the deliberations that portion of the meeting. So that, let me be clear about what that means. Public comment has already happened. The staff report has already happened. We will be issued a supplemental by staff and council will pick up right at the deliberations point at uh, March 26th. Second. Any discussion? No. Yeah, just shortly. So we're going to have a new staff report. No. But oh. A supplemental that weighs the 1,500 pages. We're going to have a supplemental staff report, but there's going to be no, no public comment. Isaac, this is. Yeah, I would say it's in the discretion of the council. Um, I would say we had a notice public hearing tonight. The council solicited public comment, took statements from the applicant. It's within the council's authority if it wants to continue the item just for purposes of deliberation uh, to give staff, the public, and the council time to review the, the material that was submitted before it makes its decision. And obviously as part of that, staff would be reviewing the materials as well. Uh, my, so my thought is, and, and, and as part of this discussion is, I don't know if there's anything relevant in that 1500 pages. If that doesn't change anything and the supplemental is no change, nothing relevant, then we consider deliberations. But if we get a full supplemental staff report, I would certainly consider opening up public comment. I but we don't need to rehash everything if nothing has changed. Right, I agree. Um, staff, are you comfortable with that as a, as a motion? Yes. Okay, and Isaac, are you comfortable with that as a motion? I am, yes. I think I think the motion on the floor uh, and seconded by Council Member Barnich would be to continue it to the March 26 mm -hmm. meeting, uh, just the deliberation component of the public hearing that was held this evening uh, to uh, review, uh, and it's publicly available online for, for all to review the information that was submitted today. So I'm sorry, okay, I'm that confused. did not, yeah. So are, are we right, going to restate? Sure. I'm going to okay. restate that. So I'm going to withdraw my motion and I'm going to restate, <laughs> okay. okay? And I'm going to get really technical here because I don't want to waste the public's time nor this council's time and go through a bunch of motions when we really just need to get to, to deliberations. My motion is that we continue to a date certain of March 26th and we will determine at that time whether... Uh, well, for purpose of continuation of deliberation, we will determine at that time, based on the supplemental report, that if new relevant information is revealed, we will open up public comment, we will have a new staff report. But if no significant information has been revealed and that is the determination of staff, it will be for deliberation only. I want to leave the possibility of public comment being open, but only if there is uh, new information that is provided. Second. Now, does that make sense, Isaac? Yes. With the two choices in there? Yep. Okay. All right. Any further discussion? No. Okay. Can we get a roll call, please? Mayor Ray Bressum? Yes. Councilmember Barnett? Yes. Councilmember Seacrest? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Guthrie? Yes. And to the applicant, nobody wants this drawn out. So if we want to get to deliberations, you got to not do this to us at four o'clock in the afternoon on the day before uh, the day of the hearing, okay? If, if it happens again, we're gonna have to continue it again. That's just our process. We care deeply about making sure that we see everything. So if you could, please do that 
ahead of time so that we can make sure that we can actually get to deliberations and make a decision. That would be very helpful. All right, so with that, we will call a recess. We'll be back in five to 10 minutes. It's not, there it is, okay. Um, we are back. This is, uh, we are continuing our meeting with item 11A. This is an update on city council goals and priorities. Mr. Downing. Well, good evening, Mayor, members of the city council. Uh, happy to be with you this evening talking through your, uh, an update on your city council goals and priorities for this biennial budget. And I will note, uh, I'm, I'm excited about this because it is the first staff report that I've written for you in four years. And it's the first pre real presentation I've done for you in four years. So figured why not make it on the city council's goals and priorities. So first things first, um, the city does go through a very thoughtful process in order to develop uh, their the council goals in order to help guide staff's work. Uh, and those those goals end up becoming the foundation of our biennial budget every two years. So um, we are currently approaching the midpoint of this budget cycle. So we're coming up on mid cycle, um, which is a fun term because mid cycle, mid budget, mid year, it all gets confusing. But um, so we are currently mid cycle or about to be mid cycle and the city council's current goals were adopted back in March of 2023, March 2nd of 2023. So there are four primary goals along with a number of other priorities and actions. You can see on this slide that here's all the goals that are listed out. I'm not gonna read these for you. They're in your staff report as well, but they, they do encompass four primary categories being funding, fire service, infrastructure, and the general plan update. On the following slides, we're gonna highlight some of the actions that the city has taken on your goals. Uh, however, uh, again, there's a more comprehensive list in your staff report, so I'm just gonna highlight a few. So with regard to funding, uh, we do have under the first goal, we do have three primary strategies that are listed in your goals report, and that's economic development, uh, pursue potential revenue measure, and evaluate potential to enable cannabis businesses within the city. Uh, but I do want to highlight some of the some of the items that we've done. We've successfully transferred administration of the Arroyo Grande T bid to city staff, and the city council did modify their uh, the T bids bylaws and uh, board structure. We also implemented concrete barriers. Uh, throughout the village as part of the uh, Parklet program. And I, I commend the council for uh, moving forward with that permanent uh, fixture. And then lastly on, on this, uh, we also did retain Clifford Moss in order to help with voter opinion polling, as well as public outreach, education. And based on my very first council meeting with you uh, as your city manager, you did provide direction in order for staff to continue that public outreach and education effort. Your second goals relate to fire service. And so you can see those two strategies on the screen. Uh, to accomplish this goal, we did uh, enter into a new joint powers authority between the city and the city of Grover Beach. And we are continuing to engage in contract negotiations with the County of San Luis Obispo in order for the FCFA to provide fire service to the community of Oceano. Uh, in fact, we, uh, city manager Bronson and I had a, a meeting with uh, the county CAO, interim CAO on Friday about that. And then additionally, the city has a fire prevention agreement with FCFA. So we, the city is providing fire service, fire inspection services within the city. And then lastly, I did want to highlight that uh, fire and EMS services were identified as priorities through the potential revenue feasibility study that, that we did with Clifford Moss. Uh, infrastructure is goal number three with the three major strategies shown on the screen. Uh, to accomplish these priority staff have done, a, uh, again, a number of different things, but highlighting that we did receive FEMA uh, reimbursement of funds from the storm last year. Uh, we secured federal funding for the Swing and Bridge re, uh, retrofit project. We applied for WIFIA funding for Central Coast Blue. Uh, we've worked with RCD on the Corbett Creek cleaning project, which worked very well in these uh, storms that we've had so far this year. And we did begin implementing the public safety camera project. So that's up on your screen, the locations of a number of different cameras uh, throughout the city, showing the council's investment in our city's um, safety. And then your final goal is the general plan update. And so there's a number of strategies associated with that particular goal, but I'm gonna focus on the first two. Uh, 
that being the public outreach strategy and the diversity, equity, inclusivity, and justice strategy. So with the council's leadership, staff did have uh, several different study sessions, community workshops. Uh, there was a report that was created highlighting all the work that had been done. Um, so that goes toward the public outreach component. In fact, we have a, a workshop tomorrow evening here in the in the council chamber. Uh, again, go along that same line of engaging with the community through this process. And then lastly, we do have a consultant on board to assist the city with the DEIJ lens, keeping that in mind in all of the activities that we do associated with the general plan update. However, we also know that there's a number of things that come up throughout the year that we tackle that are not necessarily directly aligned with your goals. And so I did wanna highlight some of the administrative accomplishments. Um, I, won't, I won't read them all, but showing showing things like the council supporting affordable housing, uh, 64 affordable housing units by dedicating some funds from the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Uh, we did receive grant funding for traffic safety programs through the police department. We've updated purchasing policies. We've updated, you adopted the formula business ordinance earlier this evening. Uh, our ACFR was issued and we received a clean audit. And we also, as I mentioned earlier, we won an award for your biennial budget. So that's, that's very exciting. And then on the public engagement and uh, uh, information front, we did develop a city mobile app to be able to push out uh, press releases, news releases, uh, weather alerts, things like that. Uh, I know it came in handy through the storms and the road closures that we've had. And we also reignited the citywide, citywide newsletter so that uh, Latest edition was printed earlier this month and it is available on the city's website as well. And so with that, that's just a small smattering of all the work that you, the council have done and the staff have done uh, meeting your goals in the last eight months since July 1, 2023. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have and go from there. Thank you. All right, let's check in with council, see if we have questions. Council member George, any questions? I have no questions, thank you. Council Member Seacrest. No questions, thank you. Council Member Burnage. No questions, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Guthrie. I don't have any questions. I have comments, but no yes. questions. I got two. Um, it's part of our goals. Was the CAO meeting regarding Oceano Fire Service productive? So you as a board member of the FCFA, uh, JPA, will hear a status report on that uh, next week at your board meeting next week on the March 7th. Um, so I would hesitate to give any update to the rest of the council at this time. Got it. And um, on the award, didn't occur to me to ask this question. What did we do that was so awesome besides just being generally awesome like we always are? Uh, besides being generally awesome like we always are, I'm really hoping that our finance director, Nicole Valentine, is going to come swooping into the room and explain exactly Her what that award is. beautiful sweater should be seen on television. There it is. So. <laughs> I don't mean to question your awesomeness because you are awesome, but what, what did we do that got the attention? Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, you know what, we had not uh, applied in quite a long time, and so uh, we added a lot of required items that we had been lacking for in a lot of our previous documents, and then um, our management analyst, Aaliyah, helped uh, really improve a lot of our community uh, information and documentation, so just extra info to the community added awesomeness yes yes got it all right great thank you congratulations thank you thank you very much all right that's my only questions so let's go ahead and open up public comment would anyone from the public like to speak on this item hello uh two questions uh one for the funding uh, evaluate the potential cannabis business in the city. Um, I guess like what kind of what kind of business like like farm or like a shop. I guess maybe you guys don't know like exactly what it'd be just being open in general. And then for the general plan update, um, the second point, the uh, the DEIJ lens. I kind of know like generally kind of what that means, but like specifically what will the consultant like help the city do? Like what, like is there like a specific, yeah, I guess maybe more specifics on like what we're paying the consultant to do. Anyone else? 
Okay, let's check in with City Clerk and see if there's anyone online that would like to speak on this. If any members of the public on Zoom would like to make a comment, please raise your hand. There are no raised hands. All right, so we'll close public comment. Uh, so, staff, specifically, Mr. Downing, um, can you explain the cannabis statement? Certainly. So, uh, as we see in that item, there's a number of different sub uh, subtasks, actions. So, uh, conduct a study session with the City Council regarding potential cannabis ordinance. That would be getting feedback from the five of you as to what you would be interested in, if you would be interested in, in, a, in anything. Uh, prepare and adopt a cannabis ordinance if directed by City Council. Again, back to my previous comment. And then evaluate the feasibility of a cannabis tax. Uh, many communities throughout the state, once it became legal, they implemented their own local sales tax on cannabis products. So uh, if the council ended up uh, moving forward in that realm, we could potentially look at uh, implementing our own cannabis tax. Thank you. So the short answer is it's in the staff report, so you can take a look there. <laughs> um, so the, the 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 PowerPoint is a much smaller version of what we see. Uh, and can you explain the DEIJ um, efforts? And I, I got to see some of it when I came to the first community workshop. It was actually uh, fairly impressive. And we talked about it with regard to the website as well. Mm -hmm. But can you speak to what the consultant is doing specifically with DEIJ? Sure. So I'll, I'll give a I'll give an overview, and Mr. Pedrotti is here. If I miss anything, he can also add on to that. Um, really looking at the entire general plan update process, making sure we're not leaving anybody in our community behind, uh, whether that be a language barrier, uh, economic barrier, um, uh, ambulatory barrier, anything like that. That we're that we're constantly trying to reach all of the members of our community, all of those that live, work, and play in our community and also uh, making sure that we're looking at policies that address those different segments of the community as well. So that's a broad overview of, of the type of work that that individual does. And I don't know if there was anything else to add. Yes, thanks. Uh, Brian Pedrotti, Community Development Director. Um, I think um, City Manager Downing um, kind of hit on the head. We're looking for inclusivity um, in the outreach um, particularly. And so we're trying to reach as much of the the population of the city of Rio Grande as possible. And so um, that involves some kind of targeted outreach and um, we have our DIJ consultant kind of uh, review our outreach uh, and then review the policies that come through on our general plan and, and make sure that we're reaching all the population. And again, um, looking at opportunities for accessibility, um, making sure we are addressing all ages um, in the city. Uh, there's lots of types of uh, inclusivity. So. All right, thank you. And, and that consultant will be at our, um, at our uh, workshop tomorrow. All right, thank you very much. Okay, so I don't remember if I said the words public comment is closed, but public comment is closed. <laughs> So we'll bring it back to the council. There is no action to be made, but um, if council has any comments to make, now would be a great time. Council member Secrets, do you have any comments? Yes, thank you very much. Just briefly, um, I'm, I'm proud of everyone, how hard everyone's worked, and I think it's really awesome that this many things were able to be accomplished. And I, I just credit everyone's hard work for that, you know, with that and also the insight last year to narrow down the capital uh, improvement projects and the projects in general just seems like it's really paying off. Um, staff are able to focus on, on fewer, but you know, pr fewer projects, still a lot, <laughs> and then prioritize. Um, so I feel like just really some quality focusing um, on what we deem, the, it's all important, but what we deem the most important, and I just think it's impressive, so thank you. And, thank you. <laughs> and um, I'm still excited about the Corbett Creek cleaning project. That's been amazing. I haven't seen it, but I've seen photos, and it's, it's pretty phenomenal what's been accomplished. Um, and I think the recent storms show that's paying off. We're not having issues with that. And I'm also giving a shout out to the public safety camera program. So glad that we're finally up and running on that. I know there was problems in the past and just coming from the district attorney's office, it means a lot to people um, that are prosecuting all different crimes. Because uh, if you, a lot of it, unfortunately, or for just the way it is, it shows up on public cameras um, and it definitely helps to have it documented. So thank you. All right, Council Member George, any comments? I do have comments, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for the comprehensive first report. <laughs> comprehensive. Comprehensive. <laughs> um, we've accomplished a lot this first 
half cycle, I guess cycle is what we're using. Um, and I'm really proud of what we're doing. Not only are we keeping our goals and priorities in mind every single day and every, obje uh, every project that we do, but you take on other projects and try to fit those in as well. And I commend you for that because um, storms aren't part of our um, goals and priorities, but they happen and you have to pivot. Um, so I just wanted to commend <coughs> you. There are a lot of times we ask you to do things outside of our goals and priorities, always keeping goals and priorities as our top, um, but you always find a way to make that happen. So I just wanted to commend staff for all of their excellent work in addition to um, everything that was listed there. All the stuff that isn't listed is also um, very important. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the general plan update. We gave you a very short timeline to do so and we asked for a lot of outreach and I see that up until this point, you're doing an excellent job with that outreach, really trying to get into our community and to get the feedback that we need because this general plan is about our community. Um, so their input is very important. And so I recognize um, all the efforts that we are making to reach um, all of our residents. So I wanted to acknowledge that. Um, when we adopted our DEIJ policy, it was really our intent to not just have a policy, but to have a way of life, to have that lens in everything that we do, not just have to acknowledge that, oh, we have the DIJ and then let's just make that a component, but really to to blend that into our culture so that it's it's first nature and not, or second, na second nature? Second nature, <laughs> so it's not something that we have to actively always think about, but because we do it all the time, it's just muscle memory. And I feel that we're getting there and the fact that we're being so um, purposeful in, in addressing the EIJ in our general plan um, gives me great hope that as time goes on, this that second nature will kick in and it will just be how we operate when we hire employees, when we, um, work in our on our sidewalks or all the things that we do in our city that keeps our city running keeping that dij lens is really important to me and so i appreciate that the city is also taking that and making that an important uh, priority as well so thank you for that thank you for your hard work and i look forward to the next update councilman burnish mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for your brief but concise um, presentation. <laughs> appreciate appreciate that. Um, <laughs> comprehensive, brief, concise. Um, so I just I'm excited that this is so condensed. Um, we always were doing a lot of work at the city, but I felt like we were kind of all over the place. And then when we year, a couple years ago decided, okay, we need goals. We had all these different ways to do it, and and some of them weren't great, and some of them. It, were okay and they got better and better and better. And now we've really um, narrowed down the field of what council and the residents think is important. And this helps staff be able to prioritize. And it also helps council when we come out, come up with some crazy idea. Not crazy. Uh, yeah, you can tell us, hey, is that un goal number two or three? And then we say, oh yeah, shoot, okay. So I just, I think that this is this is really so good for everybody. And if and also if the if the um, residents come to us and say, hey, how come we're not doing such and such? We can sort of point them. Well, here's our goals, and this helps us really get things done and focus in. Um, and staff is doing so much more than this. Um, and so, but but what we've accomplished really is is huge these last couple of years, among other things like storms and floods and pandemics and stuff. So um, excited that staff is carrying out the council's wishes with these goals and the projects um, that you're getting done and just look forward to um, the, you know, the next the next year and see what else we uh, we come up with. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Guthrie. Yeah, I too will uh, echo the impressive is the, the number of things we've gotten done here. Um, and, and just know we have several really big capital projects coming up um, and uh, that, that have really significant timelines that, 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 that might bump some of these. That some of the, it'll only be three items, but, but it's a lot of work to do uh, to, to do the traffic way bridge, the Halcyon project, and then 
every time we have a spare dollar, we spend it on roads. So um, another project there. So I, I do, and I, I point this out to the city, the city engineer, that I think we need to take a hard look at some of the dates have maybe not been updated. Uh, we, we do have traffic way bridge and Halcyon, but slated in the same in the same time zone. I know that's probably not going to come down that way, and it shouldn't. But update update in general. Look at the at the other things. I think one thing I'd like to see us perhaps prioritize. It's on the list, but but really we keep kicking down the road the rec building, and there, we talk about oh maybe this and maybe that. We we, we need to to arrive at some sort of a decision. I don't think we need a big plan and you know hire a bunch of consultants or anything, but really start to arrive at at some sort of a decision there so that five years from now, we're not still, we're, we're not still in that building. Um, and the other thing would be the tally ho, what I'll call the tally ho re retention basin. I, I do think getting that, that squared away, I, I know it's complicated with, with the county and the, Retention base may not be the right word, but you know what I mean there. I, I think those are two things I'd like to see uh, uh, sort of de definitely not fall off the fall off the map here because they are somewhat time critical. Thanks. Um, so continuing the love fest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But what I'd like to see in the next report is a section on what else you did. Because I think that it's important for the public to see what you're doing, mm -hmm. and, and that's great, and how we're, we're, we're achieving the goals that the council has set for staff. But there is a balance. Uh, the, the, the reason we're prioritizing work is so that there is bandwidth for the, for the things that you, you almost made me spit out my water when you said that storms are not part of our goals. Um, but there are also just other things that come up. And as an example, and one I want to put on the radar is it is very clear we're going to have to address the cell tower ordinance. And that's going to get on this list, whether it's a priority or not, because it's come up and it's something that we clearly have to address. It's not going to help the current situation, but we know that that's an issue. We need to deal with it. And so by having these priorities, it allows us the bandwidth to be able to address the things that aren't on the priority list, but become priorities just due to their very nature. And so I don't want to give the public the impression that this is all we do. So, you know, again, there can be a section on, yeah, we did all this and here are these 10 other things that we did as well. And that, that shows the, the, I think there's a lot of impression out there that there's a lot of waste in government and it is quite clear to me and especially as compared to other cities, us and Atascadero are the two ones that run most lean per capita and we do as much as we can possibly do with taxpayer money and I want everybody to see everything that we do with so much less than other cities have. So. Um, uh, those were, I guess those were two requests for next time, or, or kind of putting the cell tower thing on the on the radar, and secondly, um, you know the 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 yes and we also did yeah. these other things. So I I will uh, echo all of your kudos to the to the staff and to you all um, because I have only been here for a month and a half now, <laughs> uh, approaching two months, but still just a month and a half. Um, and so my, my hat is off to all of the staff and all of all of their staff who do all of the hard work each and every day. Um, and I think it, I did kind of update the the layout of the report. That's why I added the admin, uh, additional administrative items. Um, and I think there's room for continued uh, um, additions to that from, from the department head team and from others uh, as we, department. right. Um, so I think, yes, uh, we'll continue to add, yes and we'll continue to add to that. Uh, and then I I agree, I've, I've heard from a couple of you that we, we believe we need to look at our uh, telecommunications uh, guidelines. Um, and so I'm seeing several nodding heads and so we'll fit that into one of our uh, city council goals as well, whether it's an actual goal or whether it's an additional administrative uh, accomplishment. All right, great. Any further comment? All right, that is a receive and file, and so we shall consider that received and filed. 
Uh, under item 12, we have no new business tonight, so that takes us to item 13, council communications. Uh, I'll look always at Councilmember Burnage first. She's saying, hmm. Mm. Councilmember Guthrie, your mic's on. You ready to go? I'm just going to say, do you want to formal, formally request staff to bring back a, an ordinance, or are you just going to leave it do as part of Do you need that? No. Okay. I think I saw a majority of the council nodding in support of that item, so I will uh, I will formally say yes. We will we will look into that. Okay. Um, I have two things. First is a question about uh, council uh, report outs, and I see that TBIT is still in my uh, section, and I thought that we had decided, and maybe we hadn't, but I thought that we had decided that because we. Uh, restructured oh, it right. and we have a five person appointee mm -hmm. I don't need to liaison that anymore is that you're correct? correct that's just a, a template error okay when you said that tonight I went oh and circled it so okay. we'll, we'll take care of it <laughs> not a problem not calling out anything I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't overlooking my um, responsibilities but I had believed that that was um, what was intended um secondly I wanted to thank the city for the ninety five hundred dollar um, grant to the child and um, the Center for Child and Adolescent Mental Health. And I wanted to let you know that we put that money to good use. And one of the things that we offer every month uh, is a parent drop-in. It is a free uh, resource where you log on to um, our uh, Zoom link and you get to spend an hour with a licensed clinician as a parent and you get to ask them anything you want to ask them in regards to youth mental health. So if you have a child that's struggling with youth mental health um, or you know a child that's struggling with youth mental health and you just want to know um, about medication, about ways to soothe them, whatever your questions might be, um, and there can be a lot of them. This is a great free resource that we offer once a month, um, and it will be tomorrow at um, 530, and you can go to ccamh.org to get the link. How are you getting the word out about that? Uh, we have flyers out to all of the practitioners in our area who have children that they treat um, to offer their parents. It's in the schools. It is on social media. Um, any volunteers that want to help with social media, feel free to hit me up. Um, yeah, so we're just, it's a lot of word of mouth right now, and it's growing, so. Great. <coughs> Councilmember Seacrest, do you got something to add there? Uh, yes, and first I have a question, and thank you for the information. That's a wonderful organization. When you talk about a parent's um, consultation, is it is it sort of like group, or are people identified? Can they ask questions? Yes. You know, so are they going to be in front of a bunch of people on Zoom? How does that work? So you can leave Isaac, your... do you have your mic on on purpose? Are you telling us to be quiet? Okay. <laughs> you, can, sure. you can. You sure. can. Uh, <laughs> so we have a form online that you can submit questions ahead of time. Okay. If you want to be anonymous, um, you can keep your camera off so that you can be anonymous. If you want to turn your camera on and be part of the support group, you can. The goal would be to have enough people so that we can eventually break out into individual um groups so yes Thank but you. it can be anonymous it's a great resource i just thought some people might be wondering how it was set up um i just have one comment and i usually try to be something positive and uplifting and it, it's it's not positive and uplifting but i think we sorry <laughs> but here it is <laughs> what a segue <laughs> sorry it's just it is what it is so we all have heard i think by this time certainly about how bad fentanyl is and it's a crisis everywhere and so I just, <clears throat> I was up uh, getting training in Monterey last month and um, someone stood up and was just talking about fentanyl and the relationship with drug gangs and marijuana. And that really caught my attention because I have just, you know, that that's something you would dread to hear and I've never heard that. And in my years as a prosecutor, I never saw that. So um, someone at the table I was where I was eating lunch, I said, has anyone heard of this? Because this just sounds very bad and I don't, you know, anyway, has anyone experienced it? And and she actually connected me with a gentleman that's um, on the city council. He's also a pharmacist. And so I, we had a big chat the other day. And unfortunately, it is something that's happening. And they have empirical evidence in terms of they're, they're interviewing law enforcement. But they're also interviewing uh, drug dealers that are coming out of prison and jail who are admittedly sprinkling fentanyl on marijuana. Um, so it's just a big, a big warning um, because it's just so dangerous. And I just feel like marijuana use is increasing from what I'm hearing. So... Um, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. 
I usually try to end on a smile, but that does not bring a smile on, the, on my face. Um, okay, well, uh, so that concludes council communications. Thank you, everyone. Um, so I will turn it over to our city attorney to announce our closed session. Uh, thank you, Marin. It is a bit of a lengthy readout uh, for our closed session this evening. So. Uh, the council will be adjourning for a closed session conference with real property negotiators per government code section 54956.8. It's real property under negotiation along traffic way, including the following addresses and negotiating parties. I'm just going to read the negotiating parties. The APNs are listed on the website. Uh, ben Dohi, Trey et al., Romo and Mercedes Fernandez, Dan Fritas Rental, 3LP, a California LP, Mez Hansen, Rafi M., uh, Calusian Coyote Real Estate Corporation, Land Vest Limited Pacific Group Fuel LLC, Pearl Coal uh, Family Trust, and Adam H. Sarawatari. Um, and the agency negotiators are Matthew Downing, City Manager, Bill Robeson, Assistant City Manager, Public Works Director. Under negotiation are price and terms of payment, and an apology to anyone whose name I butchered on the record this evening. Thank you. Uh, let's go ahead and open up public comment on the closed session item. Mm, and we'll see if there's anything online. If any members of the public on Zoom would like to make a comment, please raise your hand. There are no raised hands. All right, so we will adjourn to closed session. <laughs>